Chair Dudley, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you. Still frustrating that we're Zooming this, but hopefully this will in fact be our last one. Now, please join me in a moment of silence honoring the officers who lost their lives since the last meeting. Officer Tyler Lenahan, Elk Grove Police Department. Officer Nicholas Villa, Huntington. <laughs> Let me start with the last officer, Officer Nicholas Bella, Huntington Beach Police Department, Officer Jorge David Alvarado, Salinas Police Department, and Deputy Aubrey Phillips, Alameda County Sheriff's Office. Now for a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, Ms. Nunez, will you please take the roll call? Sure. Barcelona? Here. Braun? Here. Brazil? Here. Bowie? Bowie? She was here at the last meeting. Maybe she's here. Temporary. I'm here. I'm here. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Donalyn? Here. Doyle? Here. Dudley? Here. Yule. Here. Gordon. Here. Long. Long. Here. Marsh. Nieto. Here. O'Rourke. Here. Ramirez. Here. Thank you. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Acting Advisory Committee Chair, Sheriff Randy Walsh. Randy, you there? Good afternoon, thank you. Okay. And Post-Legal Counsel, William Toby Darden. Toby? I know you're there, Toby. Yes, hello. Okay, wonderful. Good afternoon and Post-Executive Director Manny Alvarez. Good afternoon. Thank you. This is the time set aside for members of the public to comment on items on the commission agenda. Pursuant to the commission policy, the commission chair will manage the public comment period in deference to the commission's workload and meeting time constraints. Up to 15 minutes is allowed at the beginning of each commission meeting for public comments on items on the agenda. Based on recent events, more people than usual may want to address the commission. Therefore, if required, we'll go longer than 15 minutes, but may limit this period to no more than one hour as we have many topics to cover on the agenda. Members of the public who wish to speak are asked to limit their remarks to no more than five minutes each. If we have many people who wish to speak on the same topic, I, as the chair, may intervene and will ask you to limit your remarks to no more than one minute. Pursuant to existing commission policy, the chair may conclude the public comment period if multiple speakers are voicing repetitive or similar statements and the 15 minute public comment period has expired. Please be advised that the commission cannot take action on items not on the agenda. Please remember that this meeting is being transcribed, so I may politely interrupt and ask you to repeat or speak slowly and clearly so your comment can be correctly captured in the transcript. If there is anyone watching who would like to address the commission during public comment, please call in to the number shown on the screen at this time. We will take the calls on a first come, first serve basis. If other persons are in the queue, waiting to speak, you will be placed on hold until it's your turn to address the commission. You will know when it is your turn to speak when you hear that you are being unmuted. Once again, you will know it is your turn to speak when you hear unmuted. We will wait for approximately one minute to allow for individuals to call in. When it is your turn, if you wish, please state your name and organization. Standing by for public comment. We have five individuals who are in the queue, Madam Chair. Okay. 
First caller, please. Good afternoon, Chair Dudley and Commission members. My name is Wayne J. Quinn Jr. and I'm the Executive Director of the Los Angeles County Professional Peace Officers Association. I am also speaking on behalf of the Association of Orange County Deputy Sheriffs and the Riverside Sheriffs Association. All three of our associations represent fully sworn peace officers who work for their respective district attorney offices, Bureau of Investigations. I wish to address and discuss with the commission the report on post-proposed regulatory action slash status, which is found under consent item number three for today's March 2nd, 2022 post meeting. I understand the report is for information only and no action is required. Nonetheless, this report, in my opinion, needs clarification. As the document reads under current commission regulation packages under review by the Office of Administrative Law, bullet number one states, Notice of proposed regulatory action, amend commit commission regulation 1005A, minimum standards for training for district attorney investigators. I also call to your attention that this same information from the report on post proposed regulatory action slash status was provided to the commission at your December 8th, 2021 meeting. The request for clarification is needed as it is my understanding that on November 24th, 2021, Post advised the Office of Administrative Law in writing that it was withdrawing its request for approval of Regulation 1005A, and that on November 29th, 2021, the Office of the Administrative Law withdrew its review of Post's October 13th, 2021 final rulemaking file submission for approval of amending regulation 1005A. All of these actions are allowed for the California government code. However, it is my understanding that since November 29th, 2021 to the present date of March 2nd, 2022, that the Office of Administrative Law is not reviewing the notice of proposed regulatory action 1005A due to post written withdrawal request on November 24th, 2021. I would respectfully re request that this information be deleted from any other reports until post resubmits another rulemaking file to the Office of Administrative Law. I'm sure this information is redundant for the commissioners and I apologize, but I'm sure the commissioners can remember being advised at your September 1st post meeting that the next post meeting was not until December 8th, 2021. And if there was going to be any changes to the regulatory rulemaking process by the commission, there would have to be a meeting before October 11th, 2021. This date was the last day that post believed they could submit their final rulemaking file to the Office of Administrative Law in order, if approved, to have the amendment become effective January 1st, 2022. Post also stated that they believed an approval or denial of the regulation amendment by the Office of Administrative Law would happen around November 23rd, 2021. I again want to thank the Commission for holding a special post meeting regarding this regulation on September 29th, 2021. Although the Commission voted to continue the regulatory rulemaking process, I know a lot of the Commissioners sacrifice schedules in the and time to attend this meeting. I believe that the number one issue of our stakeholders about the critical need of being involved in this important issue was received by the commission and that there would be a commitment in the future to involve stakeholders in post issues that may impact them. I wish I could say that the issue is behind us. Unfortunately, I cannot. As critically important of an issue that this proposed regular regulatory change has been since June of 2021, Post continues to make decisions regarding this regulation without so much as an advisement to the same stakeholders on Post's newest regulatory action. One, why weren't stakeholders advised that Post was withdrawing on November 21st, 2021, their final rulemaking file that was submitted to the Office of Administrative Law on October 13th, 2021. 
Please remember the rush to have a post meeting before December 8th. Two, were the commissioners advised of the November 24th withdrawal request at the December 8th post meeting? Three, are the commissioners being advised at today's meeting of the addendum to the initial statement of reasons that post has produced? Four, why weren't stakeholders mailed post decision to file an addendum which was on its website January 21st, 2022. Why weren't stakeholders mailed the required notice identifying the added document and stating the place and business hour that the document was available for inspection? Four, why were no stakeholders advised by post of the 15-day public comment period that occurred from January 21, 2022 and ended on February 8, 2022? Finally, Post did respond to our legal counsel via email on February 25th, 2022, advising that the Post staff is still working, completing the necessary documents for the rulemaking file, and that no date for resubmission has been determined, and that the Commission has a full year from its published notice of July 30th, 2021, about the amendment to submit to the Office of Administrative Law for review. I again respectfully request that the commission consider not to submit another rulemaking file to the Office of Administrative Law, but to work collaboratively with the stakeholders to produce a solution that is based on transparency and openness. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. Next call. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Commissioners, and Director Alvarez. My name is Tammy Morell, and I'm the Post Academy Director at Delta College in Stockton, and I'm also the new president of CADA, the California Academy Directors Association. CADA strives to promote the educational and training interests of academy-oriented programs with the intention of developing educational and training philosophies that will enhance the professionalism of the administration of justice system. We hold two meetings per year at the Post basic training consortium. At our next meeting, March 16th, we will be electing new officers. The open positions are vice president, secretary, and treasurer. As with many organizations, the vice president serves a two-year term, then is automatically elevated to the position of president for two years. After that two-year term, the president becomes the uh, CADA advisory committee representative. We are encouraging any CADA members who might be listening today to consider either running for a position or nominating a worthy candidate for any of the open positions. Also, I would like to publicly thank two of our CADA members. Damian Sandoval is the director of the Napa Valley College Criminal Justice Training Center, and he has served as CADA's vice president, president, and advisory committee representative, and is terming out after six years of service to CADA's executive committee. Walt Allen is the director of the Rio Hondo Police Academy, and he recently completed his term as president. And as you know, we are asking that you appoint Walt to the advisory committee today when addressing new business. We're looking forward to continuing our work with POST, with the staff, and especially those in the basic training bureau uh, with uh, Bureau Chief Jim Grotkow and his team. Thank you very much. Thank you for the call. Next call. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Brian Marvel. I'm president of the Peace Officers Research Association of California, also known as PORAC. We represent over 75,000 public safety officers and 940 police associations throughout California. I'm calling today to provide PORAC's perspective on the Little Hoover Commission's report on law enforcement training. It's consent item B7 on the agenda. We were pleased to see that the vast majority of the recommendations provided by the Little Hoover Commission closely align with PORAC's own recommendations for improving police training in the profession itself. This includes efforts to raise recruitment and training standards, improve and increase curriculum and hours spent in the classroom, scenarios, and more. We fully recognize that improved and increased training will be fundamental to better prepare our officers to meet the expanding challenges and obligations that are placed on the law enforcement profession today. However, PORAC has significant concerns with the recommendation 11 in the report, which calls for additional members of the public to be added to the post commission board. 
This comparison between the California Board of Medicine and POST is not an apples to apples comparison. POST is unique in that it actually sets the minimum training and licensing standards to be a peace officer in the state of California. Whereas the California Board of Medicine, like all other licensing boards, merely determines whether the licensing standards for that profession have or have not been met. This is a vital distinction you must remember when discussions about adding more public members to the commission are proposed. I think we as a society can probably agree that it would be counterproductive to have to the medical profession and to patient safety for lay people with no medical experience or worse, for the victims and family members impacted by medical malpractice to have a say in how the medical practitioners are required to be trained. Law enforcement's no different. To suggest that lay people with no prior experience in law enforcement or public safety should have a say in determining how officers should be trained would likewise be counterproductive to the law enforcement profession and to public safety. If the goal is to provide lay people with an opportunity to provide their recommendations to improve public safety and law enforcement training, there are many ways to do that with the, without expanding the post commission and mandating a certain number of seats to be set aside for lay people. It's not that members of the public do not have valuable insights to provide. We welcome any and all information that could help improve the profession. It's simply that there is a difference between creating a forum for those outside of the law enforcement profession to provide recommendations that can be reviewed by experts at post for feasibility and efficacy versus giving those individuals the power and authority to advance their recommendations or political agendas as a post commission board member. Frankly, POST has a lot of work on its plate to improve training per the litany of state mandates that have come through the legislation in the past few years. These improvements take time, energy, expertise, and dollars to implement. To expand the POST Commission, particularly at this time, would create a significant impediment to getting that work done, especially as these new commission board members would have no institutional knowledge to pull from. As an officer with 22 years of experience, I can tell you that you never know when you approach an individual how they'll respond. Will they comply with your request or will they get violent and risk your life and the lives of those around you? In these moments, officers rely so heavily on their training because they trust that their training is the product of countless years of combined law enforcement experience that has been reviewed and approved by the experts at post. The bottom line is that PORAC agrees with the Little Hoover Commission that the academy training and annual training have not kept pace with the increased expectations and duties placed on the officers today. However, when it comes to those who sets the training standards and curriculum that will ultimately determine how prepared or unprepared our officers are to serve our communities, we believe that should be left to the experts. I thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Next call, please. We have three callers in queue, just so you know, Madam Chair. Marie, I couldn't hear you. Did you say something? We have three people in queue, but nobody is talking at this point. Okay. Would anyone who has called in, apparently there are three of you, like to speak at this time? If not, we'll continue with the commission agenda. I will take that as a no. Thank you so much. Muted. At this time, at this time, the executive director would like to address the commission. Executive Director Alvarez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioners, uh, again, for all your work and for uh, your participation today, as well as for permitting me to, uh, to speak to you. I generally like to uh, address what we have been working on since the last Commission meeting and what we will be working on in the future um, between Commission meetings. However, for this meeting, I think I'm just going to address what we've been working on since December because I believe the rest of the commission agenda will explain what we'll be working on in the future. I'm gonna hit on a few things, not everything that, uh, that we've been working on that is significant, but matters that may be of interest to you, uh, I will touch on. 
So there is a consent item on use of force guidelines in the agenda. We initially anticipated doing a presentation uh, on that uh, on those guidelines. We're not going to do a presentation unless you would like one. But we have recently modified the use of force guidelines uh, a third time in the last 18 months to address AB 26. Um, there are certain requirements in there. One, one of the major ones being immediate notification of excessive use of force uh, reported inside of the department. So we modified those guidelines, uh, those uh, uh, guidelines in the last uh, few months. Additionally, in, in uh, relation to AB 490 on positional asphyxia, we released a, uh, a micro learning course on June 30th, 2022. Um, since that time period, as of today, there are 3,755 individuals who completed that micro learning course, obviously a, a significant number for, uh, for a short period of time. That is the first course that we have released as a micro course for one hour of CPT credit. It is less than one hour of training. If you all recall, approximately two years ago, you provided us authority on high impact, high importance courses to give credit, uh, one hour credit if they are less than an hour. That is one of those courses, the positional asphyxia course, and it is housed on our learning portal. We also released Beyond Bias, uh, as a, a man, a, the training course that uh, fulfills the mandate for racial profiling and an identity training, the five-year mandate. I think we've discussed it at prior commission meetings. We were a little delayed in the release of that, but it has been released. It was released on January 11th of uh, this year. And as of uh, this morning, there are 7,318 individuals who completed the, uh, the online training on Beyond Bias. We finished out the year at 91% in terms of our compliance audits. We were impacted uh, at the very beginning of the year with, uh, with travel, with COVID. We picked up significantly in the spring, in the summer, in the fall. So we did not reach the 100% goal that we tried to uh, reach, but we were at 91% and completed 6,293 reviews of appointment files across the state. We've also been working on an ICI detective course on uh, science-based interviewing. We hope to have that ready for delivery sometime uh, this calendar year. That is pursuant to SB 494. SB 494 was not uh, signed into law. However, we had had some discussions with the sponsor and the author of that bill saying that we intended to move forward uh, one way or another, and then there was some direction provided by the governor in his uh, veto of that bill directing post or re directing post to, uh, to try to move forward in certain aspects of it. So we have been. We've also been working diligently on bias screening of peace officer candidates in a number of areas. I think you will hear more of that in May at the May Commission meeting. We are now in the process of updating and in, um, recruiting additional facilitators for our team building workshops. A bulletin will go out shortly in that regard, seeking new facilitators. And we've also bumped up the number of team building workshops and we hope to have 50 to 75 of them done by the end of this calendar year. Maria mentioned at the finance meeting, various uh, aspects of dispatcher training that we're uh, working on. We actually have two bureaus that have been working on that for the last six months. And we hope that in a future commu commission meeting, not sure if it'll be May or September, but we'll be able to present material on the revised basic dispatcher training course. We've also been working on four management studies for police departments across California. The, the following four are pending right now. Blythe PD, Hermosa Beach PD, Rialto PD, and Central Marin Authority PD. We are scheduled in May to update the wellness portion of the basic training uh, course. As many of you know, we, we embarked on that project right before COVID hit and it all stopped. We literally were starting uh, with the first workshop in March of 2020. We are now scheduled to restart that program here in May. 
As you will notice in the commission uh, agenda item uh, or the finance uh, contract items, we've included $304,000 in the MOT contract on the Museum of Tolerance contract to develop a documentary style video on the history of policing. Uh, as we've discussed, um, you know, our, our goal to try to incorporate the history of policing in a better fashion in the basic course, and this will accompany that. We've had two budget hearings in the month of February, one before the assembly and one before the Senate on two budget change proposals that were also discussed in the finance uh, meeting. One was on uh, wellness workshops that we're proposing to put together over a three-year period, as well as a budget change proposal on Senate Bill 2, which Maria spoke about at, uh, at the finance meeting and I know is on for a presentation today for SB2, so I won't go into uh, more detail in that regard. Lastly, in terms of just uh, administration, we've submitted a stage one business analysis uh, for software solution um, to address SB2. We submitted that to the California Department of Technology on January 10th. In December, we've signed a new lease for the existing building that we're in. Um, that lease includes several tenant improvements, including construction of two areas of the existing space, it includes added security for personnel safety. I won't go into that. And it includes EV charging stations dedicated for post employees. And then lastly, in terms of uh, uh, administration, we are, we are repurposing, temporarily repurposing four, uh, five, excuse me, five existing vacant positions to work on SB2. Specifically, yesterday we advertised for an attorney for position, and we will soon release um, uh, new vacancy uh, ap uh, application process for four additional HR analysts to support the hiring that we expect to do should our budget change proposal be hired. So those five um, came from existing bureaus from other, other tasks. And then uh, lastly, there are some things that we have left on the table and I, and I do wanna mention them so that you know that we have not forgotten them. I believe uh, Commissioner Donilon has asked us to address the regular basic course versus the specialized investigators basic course and whether there should be one and not two. That is still on the table, Commissioner Donilon, and I apologize that we are not ready yet. Um, and then I know uh, Commissioner Yule has asked uh, that we progress in terms of the history of policing uh, in the regular basic course. Obviously we are in terms of the Museum of Tolerance contract and we will be moving forward. So uh, it is not, uh, it's not something we're putting off. Obviously there's a, a great deal of, of uh, challenges and work um, for us. And I, I do wanna thank post staff who've done all of this. As I always say, I've done none of it, they've done it. Um, it's not without a great deal of work um, every, every bureau within post has coughed up resources, full-time resources and part-time resources to address Senate Bill 2. And uh, we appreciate all their effort and the stress that this is uh, all put on them. We're definitely up to the task and we appreciate it, but uh, um, hopefully we can move forward and, and have a, a good productive year. That concludes uh, my presentation, Madam Chair. I thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Manny. And it's hard to believe that there's been so much criminal justice reform, that we've been living through a pandemic, that we now have new law that you suddenly have to synthesize and turn into a major project for post. Um, and you, you and your staff have done it all with um, tremendous work ethic and tremendous work. So thank you so much. Now, our first item was the approval of the action summary and meeting minutes from the December 8th, 2021 commission meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Louie, motion. Thank, thank you, second. Nieto seconds. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? Ms. Nunez, please take a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Ron? 
Yes. Brazil? Yes. Bowie? Donnellan? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Did you hear Commissioner Bowie's response? No. Okay, Commissioner Bowie, I think you yes. are on mute. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that passes. Um, we'll be having a presentation on consent items four and consent items number six through nine. Would the commission like a report on any of the other consent agenda items? Okay, then let's begin with item number four. Madam Chair, if I may, we are, uh, we are inviting up to the uh, podium at this time, law enforcement consultant, Larry Ellsworth of the Management Counseling and Projects Bureau, um, who will provide a report on crowd uh, management. Larry has been working on crowd management for the last 18 months, and this is the second iteration, if I'm not mistaken, in the last uh, perhaps 12 months of the crowd management guidelines. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. And I see that I blew my lines on that one. So I appreciate you covering for me. There's an on switch. We can hear you. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Uh, Post staff recently completed an additional revision as the executive director Alvarez mentioned of the crowd management guidelines, which were originally published in 2013 and then revised in April of 2021 and now revised again. This was in response to legislative changes in assembly bill 48, which was chaptered in September of 2011, I'm sorry, September of 2021 and Senate bill 98, which was filed with the secretary of state in October of 2021. This obviously presented a very aggressive timeline, so we quickly assembled a group of subject matter experts and conducted an initial brief meeting online, which we then determined we needed a workshop for this to ensure the coverage of the many changes to policy and procedure in these new laws. <clears throat> Excuse me. We met for four days, completed a rough draft of the proposed changes, which was then reviewed within post and then reviewed at the executive level within post before being sent to our graphics unit for accessibility and publication. The guidelines attached to this agenda item are the final version, which is now available on our post website. I'll, re I'll give a very brief recap of some of the changes to the laws. AB 48 mandated changes to several laws. Uh, first of these was to government code 12525.2, which mandated change to require monthly reporting to to Department of Justice when peace officers are involved in listed uses of force, primarily when the use of force results in great bodily injury to a civilian and or peace officer. This new law, the, the update to this law also defined for this section serious bodily injury, which necessitated a revision of our use of force guidelines and also impacted the crowd management guidelines. AB 48 mandated changes to penal code section 13652A which changed to mandate requirements now for the training of officers deploying kinetic energy projectile weapons and or chemical agents, as well as when these can be deployed. This changed the requirement from what, what, this also changed the requirement for what must be announced to the crowd when deploying kinetic energy projectile or chemical agents. Most notably, it identified what's necessary in order to deploy these weapons as being objectively reasonable to defend against the threat to life or serious bodily injury or to bring an objectively dangerous and unlawful situation safely and effectively under control. AB 48 mandated changes to penal code section 13652.1 as well. And the requirement change here was for each agency to publish on its website, all uses of a kinetic energy projectile or chemical agent for crowd control. And it listed what information was required. 
This section also mandated that the De Department of Justice shall post on its website a compiled list link linking each law enforcement agency's reports. And finally, Senate Bill 90 added section 409.7 to the California Penal Code. This new penal code section mandated when officers close the immediate area surrounding a command post or establish a police line or rolling closure at a demonstration, march, protest, or rally where individuals are engaged in an activity that is protected pursuant to the First Amendment, that a duly authorized representative of any news service, online news service, newspaper or radio or television or network may enter the closed areas described in this section. This was, as I mentioned, just a brief summary of these many changes in this revised document. Can I answer any questions for anyone? Apparently not. Thank you, Larry. Thank you. Now on to item number six. At this time, I will call upon Bureau Chief Jackie Nelson, SB2 Transition Team, Bureau Chief Colin O'Keefe, Computer Services Bureau, and Assistant Executive Director Maria Sandoval, Executive Office, to provide us with the report. Thank you, Madam Jackie. Chair. We also have um, retired Chief Sylvia Moyer, who will be um, also providing a report on this. So post submitted a budget change proposal or BCP once the governor signed Senate Bill 2, commonly referred to as SB2. Post staff took a long, hard look, not just what standing up a new division would take, but what other support staff would be needed to be added to existing bureaus within post. Department of Finance and the governor's office were nothing short of amazing with their assistance. They spent a great deal of time with us to ask and answer a variety of questions in support of our 12 page BCP. What was accepted was our BCP in its entirety. Some of the highlights were taking from 127 new staff positions up to from 136 up to 263 positions within post. Our budget of $83 million up to 110 million, an increase of roughly 22,649 million just towards SB2. Post is in discussion with the Department of General Services to increase our physical footprint. And with the increase of space and personnel comes equipment needs, all of which was included in the BCP. Our biggest hurdle to date will be the purchase and implementation of software platform with our required needs. Post is unable to procure this platform until July 1st, 2022. We are working hard on all aspects of SB2 with existing funds and personnel. We have reassigned eight full-time staff to SB2 transition team, leaving, leaving other bureaus inadequately staffed just for the interim. Now I will turn it over to Bureau Chief Jackie Nelson. Thank you, Maria. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the commission. Thank you for the opportunity to present today to you on the update on SB2. So again, I'm Jackie Nelson. I'm the Bureau Chief overseeing the transition team. My presentation to you today is gonna to be twofold. First, I want to give you an update on the implementation of SB2 uh, so far. And second, I'm gonna provide you with an overview of the work that is still yet to come. So before we begin, uh, I, I just want to, um, Sorry, let me back up. So we began the full-time implementation on November 1st, 2021. In that short amount of time, we've been very successful and then made significant progress, but we still have a tremendous amount of work to do. Each step that I'm about to detail consists of significant work by our Computer Services Bureau. They've been, they've worked tirelessly to support our efforts throughout this endeavor. And I just wanna make sure I give them the appreciation and thanks for all their hard work so far, so, so how did we start the implementation of SB2? We focused on those items that went into effect on January 1st, 2022, which involved the hiring and selection standards. After identifying what those changes were, which included new disqualifiers and minimum hiring standards, we had to make immediate notification to the field. We did this utilizing a post issued bulletin number 2021-47, which detailed all of the changes. We created an SB2 page on post's website, along with an FAQ page to help answer any questions. 
and we leveraged our regional consultants to distribute information and direct inquiries back through to the transition team. So one of our first projects that we took on was to do a workload analysis and staffing model. So as a reminder, there is not an apples to apples comparison to determine the workload. So what we did is we used three different methods. We did an estimate on what we believe is the closest workload. After that, we completed a staffing model to fit the workload analysis. Each of the positions identified required an hourly task breakdown per year per position to support the request. So as you can imagine, this was a pretty tedious process while we worked with a lot of unknowns as we created that. Moving on, to bring the affected regulations into compliance with the new mandates, we submitted several section 100 changes. The changes were fairly straightforward because they were anchored by legislation. An example of this was the increase of minimum age to 21 years at the time of, an appoint of appointment. We are currently working on updates being to the personal history statement to become compliant with SB2 along with a newly created agency verification form, which will be mandated as part of the background. POSTIS developed several forms as training aids and tools to help agencies with the new requirements, and they should hopefully will be available soon to the agencies that we serve. The background manual and background investigators course are being updated to, re to reflect the changes as well. POST developed a specific California law enforcement portal with the National Decertification Index to support the mandate that agencies must query the system as part of their hiring process. Agencies do not have the authority to go direct to the index to do the queries until they have been authorized by the state level post, which is an index requirement. So we had to create a process uh, and to develop it to meet this condition for our agencies. And this is an ongoing timely endeavor for our staff currently. We're trying to figure out how to make that more seamless at this time. We have been working on modifying our internal systems known as EDI, as you probably all have heard us, to update the agency inspection database to be inclusive of all of the new hiring requirements. This will have certainly help benefit our regional consultants while they do their agency compliance audits in the field. So now I want to talk to you about the proof of eligibility, which of course is mandated by SB2, and you heard me talk about that quite a bit last time. So there are two components to this bill. The first component is post's responsibility, and that is that we must issue proof of eligibility to any currently employed peace officer who does not already possess a basic certificate by January 1 of 2023. This is a retro issuance, and it will be a one-time mandate only for post. Staff has been diligently working on this process, which is heavily dependent on our IT platforms. We have identified approximately 6,400 peace officers who will need to be issued a POE by that date. To ensure these peace officers are eligible, we've begun auditing each of these records for compliance. The second component is the hiring agency's responsibility. So beginning January 1 of 23, agencies must apply for the proof of eligibility for any newly hired officer who does not already possess a basic certificate. And this is the process that will have ensued to moving forward. Agencies will be able to apply for the certification using our existing EDI system. The notice of appointment will include an attestation from the agency stating the appointee meets all of the minimum hiring standards. POST has already created the attestation, which will be incorporated into our notice of appointment. Once POST receives the notice of appointment and confirms it is complete, POST will issue a proof of eligibility. It is at this time, the peace officer will be appointed to the POST agency <laughs> roster and the officer's profile will be updated to include their certification. The workflow for this process is coming along very well and should be ready by the implementation date. So because we are issuing a certification based on an agency's attestation, it is likely during an agency compliance audit that we will find backgrounds which were not completed correctly. 
we had to create a process for and a regulation on how to resolve this situation should we come across it to ensure compliance. Long-term goals obviously will be for post to review the background investigations electronically prior to the issuance of certification. However, that's not part of the initial implementation at this time. So staff has put a lot of time um, into developing the logistics of the case management and investigations component. We are finalizing the complaint form as we speak, it's nearly done. The process to allow citizens to file complaints online directly to post is ready to go and we will be making other forms of filing complaints accessible to the public. Several new regulations have been drafted regarding investigations and officers rights. The draft investigative procedures and policies have been written based on outreach conducted with other states and numerous California agencies. And all of the required notification documents listed in SB2 as required have also been drafted as well. We've been working very closely with the Department of Justice to coordinate the transfer of criminal records as mandated for decertification purposes. The groundwork has been established and POST and DOJ are continuing to work on this collaboratively. As required by SB2, POST is in the final revision of the affidavit of separation Similar to the attestation, the affidavit of separation will become part of the notice of termination, and that will be required for every agent, every peace officer who separates from employment from their agency, regardless of the reason why. The bill also provides for a peace officer to voluntarily surrender their certification if they choose. This process to surrender has been completed along with all of the associated documents. Also, as you know, once POST makes a recommendation to take action against the peace officer certification, the peace officer may request a review before the peace officer standards accountability advisory board and this commission. We are finalizing the process on how that's going to look now. We've made a lot of headway. We're almost done with that. Also, SB2 requires POST to develop a 40-hour course for the members of the peace officer accountability advisory board. So we have started this process, we've identified topics, subject matter ex experts, and are working on the curriculum development at this time. We've created a draft of the hearing procedure manual for the board, similar, similar to the manual that this commission follows. POST has met with the Office of Administrative Hearing to create the workflow on the cases that will be forwarded to an administrative law judge for the evidentiary review after it is done going through the commission. There's still quite a lot of work to be done on this particular portion. We've conducted a significant amount of outreach with the involved stakeholders and will continue to do so. Post is scheduled to create an informational video, which will be distributed as a reference point uh, here pretty shortly. We've diligently worked to identify the agencies that are not post participating, but are mandated under SB2. So yes, we will have to take action with agencies who are not post participating. We will, do, we will be doing outreach to those agencies to begin their introdu introduction to post and to get them into compliance with the new requirements. So post has spent a lot of time researching IT platforms that can meet the needs of SV2. We need a system to allow nearly 700 agencies to report cases of serious misconduct to a single system. Obviously, this is no small feat, small little, you know, just little, little details. However, in the unlikely event that we cannot get this done by January 1 of 23, we have created a draft contingency plan to allow POST to comply with SB2 using alternate methods. So at this time, I would like Computer Services Bureau Chief Colin O'Keefe to provide you with an update on the procurement of an IT platform, and then I will come back and continue my overview. Thank you. Colin, please. Okay, thank you, Jackie. Good afternoon, members of the commission. I'm Colin O'Keefe, the Bureau Chief for Computer Services Bureau here at POST, and I'd like to speak specifically about a case management system to support Senate Bill 2. As Jackie just mentioned, and as you all know, uh, SB 2 requires California law enforcement agencies to report incidents of alleged officer misconduct, commencement of investigations, and investigative dispositions to POST. The volume of agency reports is estimated to be in the low thousands per year to start. Receiving, routing, storing, and analyzing this information cannot be accommodated using paper records or email processes. 
And because SB2 imposes new mandates, current post systems are not geared toward this functionality. So we'll require a new system rather than upgrades or enhancement to our systems in place. <clears throat> in preparation for these mandates, both law enforcement consultant and technical staff at post evaluated at a high level, seven different off the shelf as well as custom solutions for both technical capability and business suitability. Staff received overviews from vendor representatives, traveled to other state post agencies to analyze comparable business processes, and met with several California law enforcement agencies that have implemented a variety of case management systems. During this research, staff identified the vendor provided system called Mark 43, which appears to meet business and technical requirements. This product has an established presence at several California state agencies, including CHP parks and others. Other systems we evaluated do have varying degrees of similar functionality and could be potential alternatives if the need arises. Finally, in anticipation of this contract request, post staff submitted mandatory stage one business analysis and financial analysis documentation to the California Department of Technology's oversight division, as our executive director just mentioned. Department of Technology's approval as well as project funding are pending. This contract request, if approved by the commission for system procurement, implementation and configuration should not exceed $2 million for the first year Recurring costs after the first year will be approximately $1.8 million, depending on the number of agency user licenses required. And with that, I will pass it back to Jackie, and I'm happy to take questions after the end of her presentation. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I wanna talk now about the regulations required to support SB2. So we need to recognize that these regulations are foundational. There are going to be modifications as we go and more regulations to come. So we just ask for your patience as we work our way through this process. However, as of now, we have modified nine existing regulations and created 14 new regulations for this body to review, which will be presented to you in May at the next commission meeting. We work closely with the Office of Administrative Law on these regulations and have a designated point of contact because of the volume of work and the importance of these regulations. So because of the implementation date of SB2, we are putting these regulations out for public comment in advance of bringing them to you. Well, we realize this is out of the norm, this serves several purposes. It solidifies the timeline, so the regulations will be codified by the ma uh, mandated date of January 1, 2023, per OAL's predetermined calendar for rulemaking actions to take effect. Because the rulemaking, OAL rulemaking public comment period is 45 calendar days, this allows us to invite public comments upfront and to take those comments into consideration prior to the commission receiving the final draft of regulations in May. And lastly, but certainly importantly, that this also provides for better transparency on a very important topic be before we bring this, these regulations uh, to you in May. So unless we are directed otherwise by this body, this is the process we feel works best for implementation. It is our intention to have these regulations available for public comment on March 25th of 2022. And Tobias, if you would please bring up my Excel spreadsheet, uh, page one at this time, I would appreciate it. So I'm gonna go into do a very brief summary of the regulations and I hope you all may, can see this, but I wanna talk about the existing regulations that we have um, modified that are already are in existence. So 1001, we are updating definitions. 1003, we're updating the timelines for submitting a notice of appointment and the notice of termination and adding the affidavit as separation form. 1004, we're adding the 10 days to submit a proof of eligibility requirement. 1007, requiring all levels of reserve officers to obtain a proof of eligibility. 1010, we are also adding the proof of eligibility requirement to that section. 1011, we're removing the peace officer, peace officer certification process from this regulation and we're moving it into a new section, which I will talk to you here shortly. 1012 also requires us to add the proof of eligibility, eligibility requirement. 
1050, we, up, we had to update the requirements for the peace officer selection. And I'm sorry, that was 1950, I apologize. And then 1953, updating the personal history statement and disqualifiers and adding the verification form that I talked about previously. Uh, page two, please, Tobias, the new regulations that we have created to support SB2. 1201, oh, oh, let me back up. So we, in order to get all of our regulations um, to be consistent and in one area within the California Code of Regulations, we have created a new article that will be titled Peace Officer Certification. So everything will be in a subsequent order as I go through them. So the new regulation number 1201 will be definition specific to this new article. 1202 will be bringing the Peace Officer Certificates from Regulation 1011 to this section and incorporating the proof of eligibility into that. 1203 will be disqualification for a certified peace officer having their certification revoked if they have become ineligible per government code 1029. 1204, detailing the process of canceling a certification if a peace officer appointment to a post agency roster was not done in compliance. 1205, definition of serious misconduct, which you're gonna hear more about this shortly. 1206 defines the Peace Officer Standards Accountability, Accountability Division, investigations, roles, and processes. 1207 details the reports, the reporting of serious misconduct to post. 1208 addresses the temporary suspension authority. 1209 details the notification process of the investigation, the right to review and hearing procedures. 1210 details the voluntary surrender. 1211 provides for the Peace Officer Accountability Advisory Board hearing role for decertification. 1212 provides for the commission hearing role for decertification. 1213 discusses the suspension of a Peace Officer certification. And 1214 provides for the mandated annual report. So as you can see, we haven't done much at all since, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, so we've been very busy. Um, so I'd like to talk to you now a little bit about Regulation 1205, which is the definition of serious misconduct. So as you know, SB2 mandated that the commission, this commission, um, to put into regulation the definition of serious misconduct, the bill provided for content that must minimally be included in the commission's definition. So how do we start the process of helping this body come up with a definition? Post held two workshops with different stakeholders, stakeholder groups to obtain input about what should be included in the definition. For post to remain as neutral as possible during the process, facilitators were brought in to conduct these workshops. One of the facilitators is here today to present information obtained from the workshops to you for your consideration. So at this time, I would like to introduce retired Chief Sylvia Moyer, who will present further information regarding this process. Chief, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, thank you and good afternoon. It's really my profound honor to support Californians, California policing and California post staff and commissioners, this commission in the effort to interpret and implement this significant legislation. The intent of SB2 was expansive and it was clear. It was, however, opaque and entangled on how POST will interpret the language and operationalize this very consequential and sweeping law. So that is where our team described in just a moment has served as a buttress to the capable but heavily burdened POST team and executive staff. We were brought in just to buttress their incredible efforts. And they have been exceptional, not only in their leadership, but the strategy tactics and how they're carrying out this very important legislation on behalf of California. So we're going to bring up a PowerPoint. And when you see this, it is not your typical PowerPoint. And I wanna tell you why. It is not because it is really uh, heavy on text. That is not meant to overwhelm. But what you will see is you're going to see what re represents the collective input 
by the various groups, the law enforcement practitioners, the collaborators. This is just a starting point. This is not text that is created by a, by a single entity. Rather, it is that starting point that took all of this data from these groups and coalesced it into a bite-sized manageable bunch of information that you can examine, evaluate, digest, and then we're going to work through it. So this, this next slide will show you, and the post team has been exceptional. They're going to control this, this uh, slideshow. So the team and the process, Jackie lightly touched on the process, but my part of the team is, uh, like I said, meant to buttress the post staff led by Brenda Buren, Dr. Brenda Buren. She is a retired assistant chief, civilian assistant chief from Arizona, retired police chief, Kristen Zeman out of Aurora, Illinois, and I. And my hunch is that we were asked to do this work because we're recently retired from law enforcement as executives. We have served in California, Arizona, and Illinois, which have similar legislation and, and peace officer certification. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have a breadth and depth of experience in similar efforts. So that's our team. What we did was we assembled input sources, as, as Jackie talked about, law enforcement officers, uh, representatives, key collaborators that were identified by Senator Bradford's office. And then we went through and determined how can POST interpret the law and ideas leading to the regulatory language that Jackie just uh, highlighted for you. We also knew that we had to come up with the content from these various groups as a starting point to deliver to you this post commission to come up with a definition of serious misconduct. And then finally, we had to examine and evaluate the nine characteristics of conduct, come up with input from those sources, and then present here. And after this, we are going to come up with definition for those nine areas of conduct. So let me tell you what we're gonna to do today. This next slide is going to highlight it for you. Well, that changed its format, didn't it? Uh, our aim today, technology is fascinating. So our aim today is this. Number one, we're going to review the draft definitions of serious misconduct. And this is just input from those stakeholders like I referenced. Second, we're going to review the nine areas and characteristics of conduct just giving you input on what these groups said. It's not meant to be a fully fleshed out definition at all. The big thing for you as commissioners to focus on is this. We are seeking constructive input for consideration in a very crisp fashion. This is not designed to be complete creation of definitions. It's meant to just provide some foundational information for you to, to marinate on, provide some feedback that you want us to consider for our, our subsequent presentation in May. And finally, for you to understand the timing for this commission, for you to process the information and to understand more closely the decision-making deadlines. So that is an ugly slide, but it was very pretty when I sent it over. So let's dive in. Like I said, I hope you forgive the, the abundant amount of text, but we're gonna go to the next slide. And that is the serious misconduct definition drafts which is really ugly on your slide. So I'm going to read it to you. The first one on your left is serious misconduct is a single or repeated act or omission which violates one or more of the nine criteria set forth below, which will be below, demonstrating an officer's failure to uphold the community, ethical and professional standards, therefore temporarily or permanently reflecting a lack of fitness to serve as a peace officer in the state state of California. The second is this, serious misconduct, it's on your right, is a single or repeated act or omission which violates one or more of the nine criteria set forth below, demonstrating an officer's failure to uphold the community, ethical, and professional standards, therefore prompting a review to determine the ineligibility or revocation of a peace officer's certification. To put a finer point on this, it is very important that we recognize that this is the coalescence of input from a variety of sources and not meant to be flushed out in whole. 
at the conclusion of the presentation, we're going to ask for your input. And we ask, like I said, for you to come up with any top line items that you want us to consider for further fleshing out in our efforts. So those are the two definitions that the teams came up with to coalesce for serious misconduct, which is a mandate that this commission comes up with down the road. My hope is that as we go to the nine characteristics of conduct, that the visual will be easier for you to digest, but I will give you a verbal and, and read some of these to you. So this next slide, diving into the nine areas, the first one, as you know, as commissioners is dishonesty. And what the groups in essence offered was this very heavy task of how do we define dishonesty? The practitioners, the collaborators gave a lot of input and we came up with some of the top line things that they offered. Dishonesty must be intentional and willful. They also said that dishonesty should be a basis for decertification, that small lies be lead to big lies, that the allegation of misconduct, not the finding of the investigation is critical. They really wanted to identify not just relying on what a sustained discipline from a department would offer as a single standalone standard, uh, but they wanted post to determine if the alleged conduct should be reviewed for potential decertification or further action. And that was really important uh, for the folks that were, that were offering. I like that. We give you, we give you Jackie instead of the, the PowerPoint. Um, additionally, that the dishonesty is intentional, and willful, that it is not something that was done on purpose versus being an accidental uh, mistake of fact, for instance. That was important for, for the groups, that it's wrongful. Uh, and then there was a, a finer point around under administrative admonition or oath in a criminal court or in response, the act must uh, occur in this environment. So if, if I were sitting on uh, your side of this screen, I would likely think this is a lot to digest. Uh, it is. And that's why uh, this post team determined the most appropriate thing to do was to present you with this massive body of work so that you could uh, give top line ideas and thoughts and then have uh, a, some work by the team prior to the final presentation in May. So that is dishonesty. Uh, we next move to abuse of power. Under statute, uh, the number two was abuse of power. And that really offered that language may include an officer having an ulterior motive to harm, annoy, or harass. Uh, there was strong opinion that the officer must benefit personally uh, that retaliation or make, making retaliatory arrests and use their public office to interfere with the rights or immunities of another was demonstrative of an abuse of power. The provision for the misuse and improper access of a database or surveillance was a particular note or surveillance tools was also a particular note for the groups for consideration as post moves forward. Soliciting information from people for the, for the purpose of acquiring or including information in databases was uh, equally energized. The intentional willful uh, without legal justification and that the abuse of power being malicious and occurs under the color of authority was a particular consideration as Post was going to move forward to create definitions. Again, this is coming from a variety of sources uh, and is, is a starting point. We move on to physical abuse. Physical abuse includes the failure to intercede, strong opinion uh, regarding domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, denial of medical care, and the failure to provide medical care, uh, vehicular assaults, use of chemical agents while restrained, failure to safely restrain, and failure to de-escalate and or demonstrate indifference, including, and of particular note for you in consideration as commissioners, uh, several of these nine areas of conduct, the participants offered that on-duty and off-duty conduct should be equally weighted in terms of their significance to alert this body 
for consideration for decertification or suspension of a peace officer's certificate. Additionally, under physical abuse, acts or omissions that did or were intended to cause harm or the failure to intervene or to prevent physical harm would trigger a review. Additionally, that it is irresponsible or neglectful behavior that led to the harm of an individual. And then there are some definitions, certainly in the number of these, there are penal codes, government codes, education codes, and other existing statute that shall be reviewed prior to the definition being put in place. And that was of particular note for a number of folks. So we're gonna move on to sexual assault. Uh, this was particularly interesting because it ensures that it protects all individuals, not just members of the public. And that any on-duty sexual act is a sexual assault. There was considerable conversation regarding off-duty sexual assaults and consent. Striking was that the collaborator group really said that over, there's an overwhelming power differential or dynamic that tilts toward an officer and must be considered. This was striking because it offers that the authorities that a peace officer enjoys in the state of California is so significant that it might imply that a person does not have the opportunity to say no and that consent could be questioned. Any additionally, any sexual assault under the color of authority would be striking. And then again, uh, there was conversation regarding penal codes, consent, absent quid pro quo, and consider repeat behavior. Still a lot, and I recognize that, and I appreciate your continued attention. Uh, the next is bias. This was striking because of the implications related to on-duty and off-duty behavior, which commissioners, I'm sure you're sensitive to. Any demonstration of bias shall be treated severely, regardless of the means. And the examples were face-to-face, -face, social media, electronic statements of bias, reflecting bias in a peace officer in the state of California. Demonstrated bias against actual or perceived identity. There was conversation regarding on-duty and off-duty. And the duty to report was of particular note. It was notable because uh, a number of folks talked about the duty to report is significant, as in the duty to uh, the failure to intercede when an officer witnesses any demonstration of bias or failure to remove oneself from a group or situation where bias is in existence or being. Uh, demonstrated. To include any witness to bias in any form or platform, the call to action was, does an officer have a duty to report? Then, a recognition that the U.S. Constitution is the preeminent law, but the urging was that POST should consider the First Amendment protections and assertions should be abandoned because the officer is held to a higher standard of conduct, given that they have unique authority and power. I wanna underscore a point here. The statement that it should be considered is important. It is not a statement by, by myself or by post or by the team that this is an absolute. The urging was by the groups that it should be considered. Also membership in any hate group, including explicit acts of bias and that the bias must be egregious or a demonstrated pattern of behavior. Again, these are considerations and a starting point. Moving on to the definition of sufficiently egregious. This is, this is significant because the bill calls out that, that actions have to be defined, sufficiently egregious needed to be defined. And the group said, look, any on-duty or off-duty conduct that is unethical, unprofessional, harmful or rationally related to an officer's fitness should be considered in terms of a definition of sufficiently egregious. The action point was that this should be a statutory minimum to provide post an opportunity to consider additional conduct for review for the temporary suspension or revocation of a peace officer certificate, giving more weight to felony charges and repeated misdemeanor offenses, and less to first time low level 
offenses. Also, the action for consideration was that officers should be notified that if they violate laws, they'll be notified they may be subject to decertifications. And the elements in the previous number three and four should be included under sufficiently egregious. Additionally, that post should consider and give substantial weight to whether rehabilitative and correct, corrective disciplinary actions were offered or appropriate in a specific case and the extent and nature of any serious injuries to the subject of the offense. There was considerable conversation and urging that rehabilitative and correction, corrective disciplinary actions are considered. And then of course, there's a reference to the government code, which is existing statute. Moving on, uh, the next was a law enforcement gain. The consideration that white supremacist groups um, should be considered as uh, significant to underscore a law enforcement gang. And then there was an urging to look at those bodies, some referenced here, that already have existing content that would inform post for the definition of a law enforcement gang and considerable consideration for off-duty conduct that would and should be considered. There must also be consideration where, what sources police departments uh, recruit and ad advertise for applicants. And consider that a gang should also include collective members of a group with biases. And the urging was don't be too narrow in describing gangs. Also, that there should be a consideration for engagement and a pattern of active participation. So moving on to number eight, and we're almost there. Failure to cooperate is significant. There are and must be a respect for legal employment protections and to examine and to ensure that officers can be obligated to cooperate with all facets of a post investigation. There are a number of processes and entanglements that exist currently. So the consideration is how would post define failure to cooperate? And moving on to number nine, uh, and this, this commission is very aware of the failure to intercede and the government code uh, AB 26 and government code 7286 that was recently signed into law in California to include the failure to intercede is essential. Failure to report, render medical aid, de-escalate shall all be considered as behaviors that would trigger a review of decertification in California policing. Altering or destroying camera evidence, the term necessary must be improved in the body of the failure to intercede. The consideration of time, distance, and tactics should be considered. And that a witnessing officer to be held to this standard, the officer using excessive force must be using force that qualifies for revocation under physical abuse, which is that previous element number three, and then include the totality of the circumstances under the reasonable officer standard. My hunch, as we go to the next, the next item, which is our, our recap, my hunch is that uh, you as commissioners are considering that this is significant in terms of what it means for guidance to post and the definition of the nine areas and characteristics of conduct, as well as the definition of serious misconduct. Again, we are seeking your constructive input for consideration in a very crisp, high-level fashion, and we don't expect that we will leave today with a complete creation of the definition of serious misconduct, nor will we leave with definitions of those nine areas of, of conduct. We will, however, give you an opportunity to uh, provide a finer point, some some text, some ideas for consideration for future consumption and work by the entire team that's been assembled uh, to ensure that we adhere to the mandates. And that concludes my, my presentation and we'll open it up at this time. Or Jackie, would you like me to turn it back over to you? 
Thank you, Chief. I think this is a good time for us to open up some discussion with the commission members and with Toby, if applicable, and Sylvia to have some dialogue regarding this. So please. Let, let me um, actually, before we do that, I'm very concerned about Kathy um, and her transcribing hands. Kathy, how, we, need, we obviously need a break now. Approximately how long would you like? 10 minutes would be good for me. Thank you. Great. Okay. So I'm going to ask everyone to please be back on time in 10 minutes, which would be 3.30. Thank you, everyone.
Well, then you could work out how to get it up there. Okay, everyone. Kathy, was that sufficient? That was great. Thank you. And I'm, I'm ready Work. to go. Wonderful. Okay. Um, let me, before we get into the discussion, let me give you a few heads up. I, we cannot lose a quorum. I'm concerned if that we're going to go past five o'clock. So I certainly want to encourage your participation in conversations, but I want you to be um, succinct as you can so that we're able to get to the agenda because at the end, there's um, contracts and a lot of other things to discuss. So uh, let's see, let's go back to um, who, who, Maria, who would you like, you or Jackie? Either or, we're kind of interchangeable. Okay, great. Um, Maria, go ahead, your mic's off. I don't know if the commission has any questions at this point, how you want to proceed. Um, it's a lot of information to toss your way. We need some guidance and suggestions on how you want to proceed and how, to, how you want to handle this as far as the, particularly the definition of serious misconduct, I think is, is first and foremost. So I throw that back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Maria, that, that was an enormous amount of information. Um, and I'm wondering in terms of digestion, uh, can this, can those who want to discuss it now and can this be continued to the main me meeting or is time of the essence where the discussion has to happen today? We are facing some significant time restraints um, and constraints. Okay. There's, there's just some, some issues that we, yeah, to go to the Office of Administrative Law, getting this passed. However, it's so significant that we don't want to rush you because this is not something that can, I think, be rushed through. Okay. We don't know if you want to have a special a special meeting or if you want us to come to UMA and do some emergency orders with OAL, we can do that too. We just kind of want to know where you guys sure. see us going at this point. Let me open it up to the commission in a moment, but let me ask you a question. Um, you're asking us to discuss a definition. I, my first question would be, is there a legal definition already? No. In the SB2, it says post the post commission, the post commission shall. Okay, so then why don't you ask the question so everyone's on the same page? What is it you want us to discuss? I want to know if you want to discuss this now or if it is too much of a topic to discuss in this particular forum, if we need to have another okay. special- I understand that, Maria. Okay. Assuming we can start something now, and I'll get the, the commission's thoughts on this. Specifically, when you say discuss this, what are you referring to? The definition of serious misconduct, I think, is our most, our first and foremost hurdle that we need to cross to find out if you guys want us to go down a certain path, um, if you want us to delay this, but okay. The, the biggest thing for us is to decide right now how you want us to move forward with this process. This is our okay. the biggest piece, I think, for you as a commission. Thank you. Okay, everyone's heard the conversation Marie and I have had. Rick has his hands up. Let's see what Rick has to say. Yeah, I have a question. This is more for Maria and for Toby. SB2 defines the nine sections, and it says that we shall adopt by regulation, I believe, the definitions that they've already defined. Is that not accurate? Which case the definition is already there. Well, actually, Commissioner, what it says is uh, it gives post the authority to adopt a definition of serious misconduct. And then it says serious misconduct shall include and it lists the nine sub areas. So I believe that the legislature intended and I think the language gives the commission the authority to adopt a regulation of serious misconduct, which is broader than the nine if it wishes to. And uh, then uh, it could provide within that definition that for purposes of the regulation, the uh, uh, definition of serious misconduct would include the nine sub areas that the legislature has mandated. So the, the legislature has simply said that we 
uh, must include the nine listed areas. The commission certainly in its expertise has been delegated uh, the ability by the legislature to further define those nine areas in a way that's consistent with legislative intent. But one of, I think the biggest decisions for the commission and it's brought up by the proposed definitions that were put before you a little bit earlier is whether or not the commission wants to have an overarching definition of serious misconduct that includes the nine, but is not necessarily limited to the nine. If the commission wants to uh, simply uh, adopt uh, and incorporate the nine uh, that uh, uh, the sub areas that the legislature has already laid out, in, in some ways, as I think perhaps you were getting to commissioner, it might not even be necessary to have an overarching definition. You can just say serious misconduct is, and then you start with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and, and we could define them a little bit uh, broader. Uh, another way to do it would be to have a definition of serious misconduct, which identifies in broad terms. And as a lawyer, I'd say we need to be careful about how we do it because when you have a definition of misconduct that could result in someone losing their right to, to pursue their profession, uh, you have to provide sufficient clarity to them so that they understand what conduct is and, and is not uh, sufficient to, to have them, them lose that. But you could have a, a definition that made it clear that certain conduct, conduct demonstrating a lack of fitness or competence to serve as a peace officer, and we could flesh that out some, uh, is, is serious misconduct that would be sufficient for the commission to undertake an investigation and make a determination whether suspension or revocation is warranted with the understanding that the nine are included, or it can simply say it's the nine. So I think that's the first uh, question in my view as a lawyer that I think the commission needs to give guidance to staff on and then I certainly have other thoughts about some of the terms and clauses and phrases in, in the proposed definitions that were put before you, but whatever order the commission wants to take it is fine with me. Does that answer um, your question? That, that's a lot. Um, yes. I'm beginning to feel like given the importance of all this, given that Toby still has more to say, given that we're making decisions that will affect people's lives in the future, that I do want to suggest that we have another meeting next month. Um, other thoughts about that? I, I, I'll, I'll continue. I, I, this is probably the most important piece for us because this defines who can be a peace officer and who can't. Uh, I personally would like to see the language and the legislation in one column and the proposed language in a column next to it, not in a PowerPoint slide, but in front of me. Um, and in person, where we're having this conversation in person. That's just my preference. Um, I also had one more question because it's super complicated and this is the most important thing we're gonna do is we, we talked about the stakeholders that were engaged. I'm just curious who they were. Um, I, I didn't see a list anywhere and maybe just, I just didn't look in the right place. Rick, what do you think about my idea to have a meeting in a month? I think we need to have a meeting dedicated to this or the majority of the meeting, if not the whole meeting dedicated to this. Okay, I'm seeing a lot of people nod. Please know that um, by the end of March, the order is over that we can have Zoom meetings. Am I correct, Toby? Or am I correct, um, Manny? March 31st? Yes, it would be March 31st under- exam. So we can still do another meeting um, between now and then, and that would be a Zoom meeting. Um, Manny, your thoughts about that? And just to be clear, uh, even after all of the COVID regulations and executive orders are over, we can still have teleconference meetings. Uh, there are just additional hoops we have to jump through if we do it that way. Sure. I know Rick also mentioned they'd like to do it in person. So we have a couple of alternatives. Manny, I'd like you to speak to these issues. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I believe you are asking about the date of March 31st, which is fine and works for us that fits within our uh time frame so we would not exactly i was asking i was saying that the executive order ends on march 31st which allows for zoom meetings correct so okay. i was saying if so i wanted your thoughts about a can you accommodate another meeting and b would that be a zoom meeting and is there a particularly good time to have that and then we can hear from the other 
commissioners as to whether that would be good for them too. But I would, before you go on, Mandy, um, Rick, tell me how important it is to you that this be in person versus another Zoom. I, I was just thinking in person, in more like a workshop format where you can actually engage and interact versus, you know, I love you all, but looking at you in tiny little screens and trying to decipher all of it at one time is just really hard. My brain doesn't work that way. Um, I, I like more of a workshop format. I don't know what um, our plan is for the May offsite. Um, it's too late, Rick. They need answers before then. So that's, that's why I was trying to get something done within the next 30 days or so. Um, that was what Maria was very clear about. So, uh, Manny, please go on with your thoughts and Rick, we can get back right to you. So, Madam Chair, I, I think we are in agreement before this meeting, we've had a significant discussion about having a special meeting and really dumping this all on you all at once and the massive amount of information. So we, we felt coming into this that you were gonna have to have a separate meeting just to address serious misconduct by itself. The other regulations we feel once they go out for public comment can be handled at the routine May meeting. Um, we do propose that if you have a special meeting that we do it in short order. Um, I believe March 31st is doable. March 31st is the deadline to complete online meetings. I am personally, I'm with Commissioner Brazil when we were doing the morning meetings. I thought to myself, this is, I'm glad this is ending and that we'll be able to do this in person for this type of a meeting. We can accommodate a March 31st meeting in person here. We will have to publish the agenda and hold it uh, like we do this meeting. Um, we can definitely do that. The question then remains from our standpoint is if, if we do have a special meeting some, at some point, should we be publishing for public comment proposed language for serious misconduct, or should we be waiting? That is the direction that we're asking for. Is that correct? Hey, let Jack? me turn to Toby for that and then tell you that I'll be on an airplane on March 31st. So um, if we went with that date, then I would ask Rick to chair the meeting. If we went with another date, I'll be, um, I'll be out of state the 23rd to the 31st. Toby, in response to um, Manny's last question, please. Sure, I, I believe that if I understand the, 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 the issue, the question is really more for the commission. The question is whether or not the commission is okay with staff sending to OAL and circulating for public comment and public hearing a proposed definition that the commission has not already seen and approved. And I believe that um, staff has explained, that uh, Jackie has explained, that they believe that by doing so, although the commission will not have seen it in advance, it does permit for the language to get out there, for there to be comment from the public, for there to potentially be a hearing, and then all of that information can be brought back uh, to the commission. Uh, I wasn't certain if, in light of the seriousness of the issue, if the commission would instead prefer uh, for these proposed definitions to be brought to it first and for the commission to see the language and potentially approve it before it goes to OAL. It is my understanding, I have not worked directly with OAL, but I know the team has, I haven't been asked to do that. It's my understanding from OAL, and I asked this specific question the, before OAL, that OAL is apparently okay with the language going out for public comment even before the commission has approved it. But again, I think it's a decision that the commission may make if it wishes uh, that it would prefer to see this language and approve it before it goes out for public comment. That does affect the timelines uh, as I think uh, Jackie and Maria have explained. Um, but again, a uh, very important issue. And the question is, how does the commission want to proceed on that particular issue? It can be done either way. I believe the commission in its wisdom and in its discretion can choose to do it however it thinks is best. Okay, uh, Rick, are you comfortable chairing the 31st without me? I am, but I think you need to be there. Well, then I can't because I'll be on an airplane. So um, if we're going to include me, 
um, then, um, and I can't even zoom that day because of the plane. So um, let me just check in, Manny, if, um, if I'm in Colorado um, and I, I can zoom in, um, even though we can do some zoom and some in person, is that correct? On the 31st, yes. However, okay. let me emphasize yeah. also as we look at the dates, the 31st is a state holiday. And just mm -hmm. to be aware of that, it is a holiday. The 31st is the last day that you that uh, commission meetings such as this can be done in person and online. Okay. So anything Manny, I understand. Yeah. Is there a time prior to the um, 22nd that you think is another good date? Or do you think that we need to do it on the 31st, in which case... I'd start groveling to Rick to handle it. One other uh, the thirtieth is the thirtieth possible. No, I'm I'm physically got out of the state the twenty second to the thirty first. So it would have to be prior to the twenty second. If I was to be physically there, I can zoom in, except for the days I'm on an airplane. Prior, let's do it prior. Let's make sure. I think you need to be there. This is too important for you not to be here. Everyone on the commission should be here on this one. Okay, then I either zoom in or we do it prior to the 22nd. Manny, is there a day that's good? And then we'll see whether it's good for the other commissioners. I think everyone should come to Santa Barbara personally, but yes, Manny, your thoughts. Yeah, Madam Chair, if you would mind, we're trying to work out the timing of the dates, the Bagley Keene notification. Uh, can you just give us a couple of minutes? So you bet. Thank you bet. You. Let me move on to, this, to the discussion just so we can stay with this while Manny and, and staff are working. Toby presented an idea that we can put language out there for public comment or we can wait. Um, I'm going to ask you, Toby, to explain again what language you're talking about and again the process. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. These are important points. Yes. So staff has been working on a number of regulations that cover a number of issues related to the implementation of Senate Bill 2 beyond the definition of serious misconduct. Uh, I've, I've seen some of them in certain forms. I haven't necessarily seen all of them, but uh, they cover things such as, for instance, um, the, the nature of the review that would be undertaken by the board, the nature of review that would be undertaken uh, by the commission and other similar uh, uh, issues. It's my understanding that staff intended to put those out for review by OAL, unless the commission decides that it, it wishes to see and approve those first. If it does that, that will interfere with some of our, 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 our timelines, although Maria, perhaps you could speak to that in a little bit more detail. And, and I believe that's why the, commission, the uh, staff had proposed to do it that way. So that's the first question is these other regulations which uh, impact sort of around the, the fringes. The second is the question of the very important definition of serious misconduct. That has not yet been put in draft form by staff, whereas many of the other proposed regulations that cover these other issues, staff has, has developed them very well. Uh, and and uh, those do exist, and and the commission could take a look at them pretty quickly. So the issue then is again twofold. Number one, is the commission okay with with any of these going out uh, for to OAL for public comment uh, and review, or would the commission prefer to review all of them prior to them going out? The second is just really the question of, since staff has not yet put together the definition of serious misconduct, uh, you received today some of the input that came in from some of the stakeholders. And the, then the more serious question is, uh, and I believe what staff was asking from the commission today was to get some sort of direction on some of these key questions. Number one, do you want it only to be the nine criteria? Do you want it to be broader than that and so forth? Uh, and then staff would go back to the drawing board, put together a proposed regulation. And then again, the commission would need to decide, would the, does the commission want to see that before it goes out to public comment? So uh, again, I hope I'm not, I'm not making this more complex. Uh, did that answer your question, Madam Chair? Toby, you're absolutely making this more complex. And All it right. did answer my question, but I certainly agree with you. Let's go to Maria, 
so that we can understand the staff and I'm not sure there was a way to make it any simpler though, Toby, so thank you. Maria? The regulations that are coming forward out of this whole process, I think are pretty straightforward. It's just processes and how we're gonna do things and the, the notice of, of, of appointment. Those types of things I think are very straightforward that don't necessarily need to have commission eyes on first prior to going to OAL because we're in such a tight timeline turnaround. Um, the one with serious misconduct, I'm hesitant to put it out to public comment before you all decide how you want to take what you want to say, how you want to dictate this to go. Um, you don't just have March. You can have April if you are available to come in a meeting. I don't want you to, to be wrapped around the axle about the time constraints. I want you to make sure that you focus and you get your words that you think is appropriate for serious misconduct. That to me is the biggest regulatory piece of this whole thing. The rest of it, I think, can go forward, go out for public comment, come back to you in May for final um, signing off. Um, it's just how you want to move forward on this. Okay. Would any other commissioner like to speak at this point? Yes, Commissioner Gordon. So just a couple of um, thoughts. Um, I am not in favor of this going out to the public uh, prior to us having a chance to really digest and comment on it. Um, I think there's a lot of potential implications of that. I have a lot of questions on some of the language and I know um, that the presentation was given a, was very thorough. However, I also know that there's a lot of information, other information that goes with that. Because some of the terms and some of the things, as I was taking some notes that I have some additional questions and need additional understanding on. Like when we talk about harm, harass, annoy, there's a lot of things that I understand probably where it was coming from, but using those within the definition, um, there's a lot of interpretation in that. So I would caution us from putting this out before we've really had a chance to sift through this, um, because I think not only from a public perspective, but from the officer's perspective, um, it's gonna create a lot of angst that we don't need to create at this moment. So I would really not want to go down that road without us doing our diligence as a commission to really look at, at this. I'm very comfortable with the rest of the regulations. I know that those are procedural and, and staff has done a great job with those. Uh, but in terms of the definition of serious misconduct, because this is what this all hinges on, I'm, I'm not comfortable until we've had the opportunity to really sit down and, and go through this. And although, you know, we've all become comfortable with the Zoom, I think um, I, I also am in agreement with Rick that I think that this would be uh, better suited in terms of a workshop for the day where we can roll up our sleeves and really have some um, in-depth conversation about what this looks like. Um, so that's just, that's just my two cents on it. Okay, uh, reading the room, which is very difficult when you're looking at a screen, it sounds like everybody would like to meet in person, that we don't want any language to go out until we've met in person and worked through it. One of the most compelling things that, from my perspective that Commissioner Gordon said is the angst in the community. If a bunch of language gets floated out there initially, that we may not ever have needed to address if we were careful in our conversations, which we will be. Um, anybody disagree with my reading of the room? Okay, so um, Maria, you put out, okay, again, uh, Manny, I'm not sure if you're ready to respond, but um, I can come anytime during the first week in April. Okay, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, during our sidebar, we, that was our proposal as well, that the, um, the language not be released until you have your special meeting. Our proposal is that uh, sometime in April that we hold a special meeting in person here in Sacramento, no language will go out regarding serious misconduct, that it will be done in workshop fashion for serious misconduct only, that those uh, the final agenda item will be presented to the commission in May for votes, and then it will go out for public comment. That will compress the timelines for for sure for us, but we will, you know, obviously push it along through OAL. And if we have to um, request authority under the emergency rulemaking provisions, then we will. 
but we think that that is best for everybody for uh, digesting the information um, and just to, to work collaborative, collaboratively with the commission and for community input uh, to you all as well. So that would be our proposal. Nothing goes out. We hold a meeting sometime in April. It doesn't matter to us as long as we can provide the 10 day uh, notice. The last piece of it is as uh, Commissioner Gordon mentioned, a lot of the other commission agenda items, they're all done, not a lot, they're all done. We've reviewed the drafts. We do propose that we push those out for public comment on March 25th, um, since they mostly are procedural. And then we bring those back to the commission as well in May. That would be our proposal. Any time in April is good with us. Okay, let me deal with the second question first. Is everyone comfortable not meeting again until after the date of March 25th and having the what Manny has described as procedural issues go out for public comment? Anybody uncomfortable with that? Seeing no responses, let's go to part two. Uh, Manny, do you want to suggest a date in April? It'd be great if we could respond to that date. Hopefully people have their calendars nearby. As I said, I'll make any day the first week in April work for me to be in Sacramento. Manny, you're on mute. The, uh, the only thing that we see is a conflict in the schedule and we know that uh, there are two um, sheriffs that sit on the commission in, uh, in terms of Commissioner Braun um, and Commissioner Doyle, and that is the week of April 28th, or I'm sorry, the week of April 25th. So anytime- I think we're focused on the first week in April. Is there any particularly good day on the first week or April or bad day? Well, we would, we would propose Wednesday since that is a normal day. Um, we would prefer to kick it off probably in the morning of April, April 6th. Okay, is there anyone that cannot make a meeting on April 6th? Okay, that's Bob and Tina, that's two. Okay, we'll still have a quorum, although boy, we miss Bob and Tina. Um, let's, let me just look at and see what happens. Um, is there anyone that cannot make it on Tuesday, April 5th? Okay, still, well, now we have three people. Is there anyone that cannot make it on Thursday, April 7th? Okay, and I just see one person's hand. Thursday, April 7th was just Sheriff Doyle. Okay, Manny, um, Thursday, April 7th had the least number of people that were um, unavailable, although Wednesday only had two people unavailable. Your thoughts, Manny? Commissioner Donilon was also not available, I believe, on uh, on Tuesday or Wednesday of that week. I believe he was uh, available Thursday. Um, okay. I would. I. Uh, Barry, is that right? Yes. Okay. I, I. I. I guess my my comments would be that I really would appreciate if uh, if Commissioner Doyle was available um, with his vast. <laughs> long-standing experience um, in, in the profession. I don't know if there's another date that week uh, that uh, I presume Commissioner Doyle is gone the entire week. Uh, we no, actually, I'm, the... I'm available the first, fourth, or eighth. Again, again, Bob? The, I, uh, April 1st, 4th, and 8th. OK. Um, how's, how's Monday, April 4th? Is there anyone else who is not available on Monday, April 4th? Okay, and that's Barry and Rick. Okay, and anyone who's not available on Friday, April 1st? Rick, okay. Well, we're, gonna, we, we, we're running into this. Um, looks like um, the best day was then um, Thursday. Did I get that right? Again, can I see a show of Bob, who I'm sure is feeling terrible about this, as I did. Anyone else who cannot make it on Thursday, April 4th? Okay, that looks like the date. What about, the what about April 8th? Stand April by. 8th? 
Is there anyone who is not available on Friday, April 8th? Yeah, that's three more people. Okay. What we have is the, so the minimum number of people would be on uh, Thursday, April 7th. Is that correct? Well, I'm sorry. Once again, you guys, I want to make sure I get this. Besides Sheriff Doyle, is there anyone else that could not be there on Thursday, April 7th? Madam Chair, do you want to venture into the following week? Um, we could. Um, I have budget hearings that week, so I become a problem again. Okay. Um, looks like I could do Monday, April 11th. Anyone who's not available on Monday, April 11th. Okay, we're out again. There's two people. I think Commissioner Doyle is going to have to have a conversation with one of us about his thoughts, and we're going to have to go with the 7th. Okay, April 7th. And Commissioner Doyle, if you would like to discuss your, your thoughts with staff person at, at post so that we can have the benefit of your thoughts, even though we'll miss you. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thursday, April 7th, you'll be receiving information from the staff at post about accommodations, et cetera. But it sounds like people sh who are from out of town should arrive on Wednesday the 6th in order to get going in the morning on the 7th. Manny, anything else? No, ma'am. Maria, anything else? No, ma'am. As to this consent item, can we stop at this point or is there anything else you need from us before I ask the commissioners to say anything else they want to say? Or can everything now be put over to April 7th? Yes. We can okay. Then let me ask the commissioners, is there anyone that would like to speak on this issue prior to Thursday, April 7th? Okay, seeing no hands. I'm sorry, Commissioner Gordon, please. Just a quick question, because that was a lot of information, although I tried to take diligent notes. Can we get something that's that we can um, have before then so that we can take a look at it and we can be a little more educated when we walk into the meeting? Maria? Absolutely. Um, we can provide you with the PowerPoint presentation that Chief Moyer put together. We can, uh, what, what information are you looking for, Chief? Uh, I just a copy of that presentation for me would be fantastic. I don't know if anyone else has additional information, but I think that, and um, I know it was mentioned, maybe a list of who provided their input, because I think that would be helpful for us all as well as who provided input and a copy of that presentation. Okay. Commissioner Brazil, did you have, you, you talked about two columns. Can you, do you want, is that going to fit or do you want to talk about those two columns? No, I can, I can do that. I'll just compare the two side by side. I just want to compare the proposed language to the language in the actual legislation. Okay. If we could get that also, if you have time, that'd be terrific. So sending those three things. Okay. Any other commissioner want to speak as to this consent item? Are you waving to me, Jeff? No, I, just a quick question. Uh, Rick had asked this question earlier and I don't think uh, we got to it was essentially and. and uh, Chief Gordon just referenced it as well. Do we know, do we have some sense for this, uh, the background of the presentation we received, who the stakeholders were or advocates or who weighed in on this? I mean, this is this is a huge deal. And if we, obviously everyone knows how carefully SB approach, it could end up with a number of people wanting to codify this stuff. So do, can we get a sense of who who's weighed in on this already? Jeff, I believe Maria offered to send that list. Do you okay. want that now or can you get wait till you get the list? Well, if Maria, if you know who it is right now, that'd be great. But if not, a list is fine. Maria? Hey, do you have the list, Jackie? Or Chief Moyer, do you have the list of individuals who sat in on that? I, this is Jackie. I do not have the list in front of me, but I can tell you that it was the first stakeholders group was representatives from the law enforcement community. Um, and the second stakeholders group were representatives from Senator Bradford's office who were contributors to the bill. Okay, thank you. And I think Commissioner Long would like the specifics on that, but that's the general answer and that's adequate. We can now. provide that. Okay, anything else on this consent item? Uh, Commissioner Donlan. Yes, please. Just, I, I wanna thank the presenters, Kathy, Maria, uh, Manny, 
and Chief Moyer. This is a, 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 a literally a quagmire of a topic, just trying to set up dates moving forward. Madam Chair, I appreciate your diligence in trying to come up with that uh, date. I'm sorry we're losing uh, our illustrious sheriff from Marin County for that meeting. Uh, but all that to say, can I just suggest for the definition of serious misconduct that less is more and we just consider one of Toby's suggestions that we just say that the definition of serious misconduct for all of you to think about are any of the nine items that we just have talked about as a suggestion moving forward because I think this is going to be a fierce complex conversation come this meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Dolan. Good thoughts. Anything else on this consent item? I too want to join Commissioner Dolan in thanking everyone on the staff who's worked on this. It's been arduous. I'm Madam Chair, Madam Chair, this is a, a Chief Nieto. Um, I, I just want to concur with them. I, and I wrote some notes down um, because it's an expanded definition than what, than what was in SB2, even though it says not limited to in, in some of the categories. And so I just want to caution that we that we don't go into expansion. We're just trying to adopt this and uh, it's there's gonna be a lot of challenges and a lot of things that happen probably as a result of whatever we adopt as a commission. Thank you, Commissioner. Anything yeah. else? Yeah, Madam, Madam Chair, again, um, Commissioner Nieto, much more eloquently put kind of where I think we stay within the bounds of our uh, commission here. Thank you. And, and the other side of that philosophy would be, Commissioner Dolan, that this is the time we can make the change. And if there's anything significant, it should be included. But we have plenty of time to give that some thought. Thank you so much, all of you. I'm now going to move on to the next item. At this time, um, let's see. I will call upon the Executive Director, Ethan Raddick. And I apologize if I got that wrong, of the Little Hoover Commission to provide us with a report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here today. Uh, in the materials presented to uh, your commissioners, I believe that um, this presentation was going to be made by uh, Commissioner Jana Sidley, who was the uh, chair of the subcommittee that worked on this report. Unfortunately, uh, Commissioner Sidley had a family matter that arose and she was not able to be here today. And so, uh, I'm here in her place. Um, I'm Ethan Rarick. I'm the executive director of the Little Hoover Commission. I might also mention that normally uh, we would have here today Tamar Foster, the deputy executive director of the commission, who was the principal author of these reports, uh, but uh, she is actually on maternity leave. So she has a very good reason for not being here today. Uh, again, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to speak today. We are always delighted to see engagement with our work, especially from uh, an agency that is the topic of one of our uh, reports, uh, and I'm deeply impressed that the uh, post has seriously considered is seriously considering these recommendations, and we look forward to working with you as the process continues. Uh, I will share a brief overview of the findings and recommendations that we have made. Uh, we have some slides, and I'll ask, I believe your staff is controlling those, I'll ask the staff actually to go to the second slide now. I believe the first um, is uh, just an introductory slide, so if you can go to the Second slide, that's perfect. The about slide would be perfect. Let me just briefly, and I know we're pressed for time, let me briefly give you a, uh, an overview of the Little Hoover Commission. Uh, we are an independent bipartisan oversight uh, agency that is charged with making recommendations to the legislature and the governor for how to improve state government. Uh, we were created in the early 1960s and the commission is composed of 13 members, nine public members, five appointed by the governor, two by the Speaker of the Assembly, two by the Senate Rules Committee. The remaining four members are state legislators, two from each party and each house. In the fall of 2020, the commission launched a study to examine the role of POST in shaping standards, training standards for California peace officers. A year-long study process included three hearings and an advisory committee meeting, in effect a roundtable discussion, where we heard from law enforcement officers, community advocates, researchers, experts from across the state and nation and others. We also interviewed many other experts, reviewed relevant uh, research and documents, and uh, conducted a survey, an anonymous survey of California peace officers to get their perspective on training. Post itself contributed to this work. Executive Director Alvarez testified before our commission 
And he also participated in our advisory committee meeting as did commissioners Brazil and Bowie. And so thank you to Post for your participation. Uh, if you can go to the um, next slide now. Um, thank you. Um, we issued, uh, actually, if you can, I'm, my apologies to the staff. Go to the previous slide, if you will. I was on the wrong slide. Thank you. Uh, as part of this uh, review, we issued two issue briefs that provide critical context and insight into law enforcement training uh, in California without making specific policy recommendations. First of those, entitled California, California Law Enforcement Survey, tailed the findings from the anonymous survey of active duty peace officers that I mentioned previously. In this survey, by the way, just to provide a short summary, officers affirmed the value of the training they received, but also pointed to some challenges. <clears throat> the second issue brief comparing law enforcement basic training academies presented a nationwide comparison of basic training academy models using data gathered from a survey of state law enforcement leaders. That brief also presented a preliminary examination of California's basic training academies to identify differences in training hours and formats, attendance, and passing and hiring rates. After publishing these issue briefs, we published our full report, Law Enforcement Training, identifying what works for officers and communities, which calls on California to assess and, where possible, improve the training that officers receive. And that report and its recommendations will be the focus of my presentation today. If I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, in our study, uh, we learned that state lawmakers have frequently looked to law enforcement training as one means to implement critical police reforms. In recent years, the pace with which lawmakers have weighed in on police training has significantly increased. In the five-year period between 2015 and 2020, lawmakers introduced an average of more than nine bills related to officer training each year, almost double the average between 2010 and 2014. This model of uh, legislative um, uh, training impositions or legislative requirements of training leaves relatively little room for thoughtful priority setting and evaluation for how that training then impacts officers in the field. Legislature does not require after the fact assessments of training, nor does it provide post the resources to do so. And I think that a key point as I present these findings to you is that we have called on the legislature to provide post resources to uh, fulfill our recommendations. Uh, thus, the state fails to look back and consider whether the training addressed the problems it intended to solve, whether it resulted in any unintended consequences in officer behavior, or if it remains relevant for the realities of the job today. The state, uh, in short, spend, spends millions of dollars on law enforcement training and yet does not require post to evaluate and nor does it provide post with the resources to evaluate whether the, whether the training achieves the intended goals and positively impacts officer behavior in the field. By conducting search on police training, we believe that California could better understand whether specific training changed behavior in the field, which type of training is more effective, and how long the training effect lasted. The state can also identify what type of training is useful and what, le what type leads to unintended consequences. However, the commission recognizes that facilitating research on training effectiveness will require overcoming a number of barriers, including current use of force data is not representative of all incidents, does not capture lesser behaviors that make a majority of police interaction. Data on police behavior is both expensive and time consuming to collect. Police academies may be resistant to data collection for fear of increased litigation risk. For example, one concern would be that behaviors recorded in training were used against officers if something bad later happened in the field. And finally, while there are many academic researchers across the country, and in our reports we cite uh, relatively new uh, academic research on these topics, still there are few academics who are focused principally on law enforcement training. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Recognizing these challenges, our commission recommended that California take greater action to incorporate academic research into training curriculum to help identify effective practices and highlight deficiencies. The commission believes that POST is well positioned to develop a body of research around police training and effectiveness, but that it must be given the resources to do so. We recommend several steps to help the state to incorporate academic research into training. First, Lawmakers should temporarily refrain from amending or adding new law enforcement training requirements. Instead, the legislature should provide post 
funding to partner with academic researchers to assess existing training requirements and determine how well they are working for officers in the field now. Post also should report the findings of that assessment to the legislature within two years. Based on Post's findings, the state then should adjust training mandates as needed, including reducing or eliminating training because it is not effective or no longer meets the needs of today's police force. Post should be empowered to, in our view, revise its process for evaluating law enforcement training to include metrics that evaluate training outcomes create a process to collect and secure data for research purposes in order to improve training uh, and establish a permanent academic review board to ensure its standards and curriculum align with the latest scientific research. This board would also be available to advise POST on ways it should define and test training outcomes. Incorporating research in this way can help identify the most effective training practices as well as training that is not useful anymore or that leads to unintended consequences. If I can now go to the next slide, please. The Commission uh, also found that California has not conducted an assessment of its 41 basic training academies. As we described in our issue brief on this topic, the nature of these academies differs in substantial ways. Some are operated by community colleges, as the commissioners know, while others are operated by law enforcement departments themselves. Other differences include the amount of instruction offered, the experience of the instructor's rates of graduation and the rates at which graduates are hired. Yet, despite these many differences, we found that no overall assessment has been conducted to compare how effective each model is in preparing individuals to become police officers. Without such an assessment, the state does not know which type of training works best for officers or for the communities in which they serve. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, we recommended that California lawmakers again provide funding to post to compare and evaluate the state's 41 basic training academies to help the state get a better understanding of what works. The variation among these academies provides a natural research experiment and California must take advantage of this opportunity to compare and measure differing types of law enforcement training. Three examples of the many kinds of issues that would benefit from rigorous analysis are, and I'll Try to shorten these, if I may, uh, Madam Chair, as I know the Commission is pressed for time. Stress versus non-stress training, the Commissioners are familiar with that. The delivery of training, as the Commissioners know, academies differ in the ways training is delivered or in their, in their instructional emphasis beyond the minimum post requirements. And experience and quality of instructors. The experience and quality of instructors can vary across academies, uh, but is of course a critical matter. Uh, in its evaluation, we believe POST should consider how well each academy is preparing recruits and identify, if possible, any best practices for academies moving forward. Again, if I can go to the next slide, please. Uh, our research revealed also that current entry-level training often does not line up with the knowledge and skills new officers need in the field. Officers, de officers describe a system that it can, can at times be rigid and that locks in training on certain topics in specified amounts of time. And as lawmakers and others add new topics into the required basic curriculum, training requirements are too often uh, compressed into limited hours. This makes knowledge retention a challenge for would-be officers. There is just not enough time in the academy to adequately cover topics critical to modern day policing. While frontline officers are required to adapt to evolving technologies, changing laws, new cultural norms, and complex societal issues, such as homelessness and substance abuse and mental illness, the training they receive has not always kept pace with these changes. Police chiefs specifically noted that some of the more rigid training requirements do not include problem solving, communications, and community policing philosophy topics that could help officers respond to various complex situations. The next slide, please. Um, the commission therefore recommended that California rethink its approach to entry-level training. <clears throat> Excuse me, officer trainees need to be given appropriate time to learn and practice the skills necessary to serve and protect their communities. While we do not take a position on how much additional time is needed for entry-level training, we do recommend that post review and evaluate the current basic academy training curriculum. Instead of compressing an ever-changing list of required topics into an allotted set of hours, 
Post should be given authority to assess and restructure the content of the basic academy. This assessment should evaluate the effectiveness and relevance of courses for today's needs and identify any gaps in officers' foundational training. This will help ensure that appropriate emphasis is placed on the skills new officers need when they need them. Post should also look for ways to make field training program, the field training program more complementary to academy training. Facilitating more back and forth learning between the classroom and the field help, help officers better relate to and understand challenges facing the communities in which they serve. Based on Post's findings, the entry level training program could then be redesigned to ensure that recruits receive appropriate and effective training before their probationary period ends. The next slide, please. We found that California requires and invests in few ongoing educational opportunities for peace officers throughout their careers. In-service training is the primary way officers stay current with ever-evolving laws, policies, trends, and societal demands, as the commissioners know. It is also a way for officers to practice certain skills specific to their role. Current ongoing training requirements are generally standardized and do not necessarily account for an officer's experience and on the job or role. For example, there are no set expectations for what officers should know when they reach five or seven or 10 years of service. There are also no expectations that officers can be fluent in defined skill sets or have achieved certain proficiencies after a certain amount of time on the job. The state's current approach to a continuing education too often results in training inequities across law enforcement departments or regions. Departments in high socioeconomic communities are more likely to have adequate resources uh, and they can choose to prioritize training. Departments operating in less resource communities, on the other hand, have little room to budget on minimum requirements. Addressing these training deficiencies is an essential step toward meaningful law enforcement reform and California must take on this critical work. The next slide, please. Uh, therefore, we recommended that California ensure that all officers are receiving adequate and appropriate training throughout the lifetime of their service. To do this, the state must invest in a thoughtful, robust, ongoing education program that is tailored to meet the state's expectations for officers, whatever their role or tenure may be. We recommend that post establish a new advanced academy experience required for officers with between two and five years of experience. This new academy can be designed to reinforce entry-level training and incorporate the more advanced concepts currently embedded in the basic academy. This would give, give officers, in our view, a, be, a chance to better apply these concepts, concepts within the context of on-the-job experience. Crucial to this new academy is including sufficient time to reinforce critical skills that are not yet adequately covered in required training. We also recommend that post review current continuing professional training requirements to determine whether they are relevant and necessary and make adjustments as needed. Lastly, post should work to improve officers access to ongoing training whenever possible. Post can make, more, can make training more accessible by providing more live or self-paced online courses, developing training and evaluation course materials for use by departments or by hiring instructors bring classroom and in-person instruction directly to the department. I want to pause just momentarily and mention here that in our survey of California peace officers, uh, peace officers overwhelmingly said that in their view, their training, the training they currently receive in California is superior to the training in other states. And yet, of course, there's always potential room for improvement. Uh, if I can go to the next slide now. Um, the last recommendation dealt with the membership of post and uh, Officer Marvel uh, made public comment about this issue already, as you heard. Um, we believe that with the standard, with the uh, various roles that Post plays uh, for a profession that requires such a high degree of public confidence, the composition of Post is critically important. Throughout its study, the commission heard from experts both within and outside law enforcement who suggested that the membership of Post could be reconfigured. We can go to the next slide, please. Our final report recommendation, therefore, calls for the creation of a more representative post commission. We emphasize that it is critical in our view that post continue to have a majority of seats for law enforcement officers. This is absolutely crucial. However, we also believe 
that post can be expanded to better incorporate a variety of civilian voices. So with that in mind, we recommended adjusting current commission membership to add additional public members, specifically members with some combination of expertise in academic research, adult education, health and mental health, and individuals from vulnerable communities. Experts suggested that adding more civilian voices could ultimately improve the relationship between law enforcement and communities statewide. Although again, we recommend that post remain a majority law enforcement body. Um, and then the next slide is just the final slide. Again, I wanna thank you for inviting me to speak today. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of our presentation, we are truly gratified that post has allowed us time to come and speak to you. Uh, I've worked through a lot of materials quickly, Madam Chair, being aware of your press for time, but I'm happy to answer any questions or hear comments from the commissioners, of course. Thank you so much. That was clearly so thoughtful. You obviously put a lot of work into that, both the findings and the presentation of the finding today, and we do really appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Yeah, so... I, I don't know who's speaking. Does any commissioner have any questions or comments? Seeing no one, I think that everyone is digesting that information and we really appreciate you coming to our meeting today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, next on now, I think we probably need another break. Katie, what do you, Kathy, what do you think? I think so, since there's a, few more agenda items to go. So another 10 minute break would be good. Okay, everyone, it's 425 now. So please be back at 435. Thank you.
Be back in the blue water. Okay, everyone. Kathy is Kathy. We don't need you to record yet. I'm going to still give you until four thirty-five. I just want to give people a sense of where we're going, given the late hour. We're going to take up our next consent item, and then after that, we're going to skip the legislative update and move on to the next item, which is predominantly contracts. We're hoping to um, end the meeting between 5.30 and 5.45. Let me just see by a show of hands, is there anybody who needs to leave at five so I can make sure we still have a quorum? Okay, seeing no hands, I assume that everyone will be available until 5.45. Okay, Kathy, back on the record. Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, our next item of consent is this time I will call upon um, Andrea Ghetto to provide us a report on RIPA, the report on Racial Identity Profiling Advisory Board 2022 Annual Report. Ms. Ghetto, are you there? Yes, Wonderful. I, I see Thanks you. So much. Thank you and welcome. Uh, thank you for uh, having us. Uh, I'm a member of the Racial Identity Profiling Act Advisory Board, and I am uh, an appointee of Sen Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins. I am the Executive Director of Alliance San Diego, and I have served on, off and on uh, on the board, the RIPA board, since its inception in 2016. And um, I am proud to, to share some of our recommendations to you. I will be brief. I know you are, are time crunched here. I just wanna say at the outset that the relationship between the RIPA Advisory Board and, um, and the Post Commission is absolutely critical to the effective law enforcement training and the building of community trust, the RIPA Board's uh, mission is to eliminate racial identity profiling and also to build community trust. And that is, as you know, so, so essential, right? We can't have public safety um, without public trust. And that's what we're aiming to do. So to that end, we, as we do every year, we made recommendations to POST uh, and we have an ongoing relationship with POST. POST uh, is part of our, our RIPA advisory board deliberations. And so um, I will summarize the recommendations that are relevant to POST. We issued a, a report on January 1st and um, it, the report reviewed stop data collected from 18 law enforcement agencies. We've been bringing law enforcement agencies on in waves uh, this coming report will include all of the waves, uh, but as of this year's report, we were still just doing the big law enforcement agencies. And so um, even so that those 18 law enforcement agencies represented uh, close to 3 million stops, which is a robust amount of data for us to review and analyze uh, and make recommendations that would be pertinent to improving 
the training and uh, the standards for law enforcement here in California. And so um, we identified uh, eight recommendations and I will go through them briefly. Um, and the first was similar to the presenter before me was to expand or change the composition of the post commission to include more community members that would strengthen uh, public trust. So we, we concur with those recommendations. Um, the next set of recommendations had to do with evaluating the courses that POST provides. Uh, POST identified six courses for the board, our board, the RIPA board to review, uh, the de-escalation course, uh, a course on beyond bias, and a course on supervisory support. Um, we looked at those, we looked at additional components of POST training, and what we, what we found were some, some common concerns uh, that led to our recommendations. Uh, and specifically the concerns included uh, that the reviewed courses did not effectively teach about explicit or implicit bias. They did not discuss in detail the impact of bias policing and the ways in which they create disparate in in out outcomes. Um, and they did not discuss how to monitor line officers for biased policing. Um, they also used some outdated language uh, such as broken windows policing uh, which is, you know, we view as encouraging officers to treat communities in ways that produce disparate and racist outcomes and to perpetuate community distress. And so we believe, you know, all of that can be remedied um, with the recommendations that we provide. And uh, those, and those include, for example, um, providing more examples of de-escalation scenarios, um, illustrating and using scenarios and specific word choices on how officer tone, empathy, and professionalism can de-escalate -es a communication um, with regard to bias, explaining bias results um, that are based on unconscious associations or unrecognized uh, preferences and to help officers understand how that comes into play. Um, of course, showing examples and providing scenario training. Those were, those are really important. We know that that's what POST does very well uh, and, and could incorporate here. Uh, in terms of supervisory support, uh, we felt it was important to, for supervisors to discuss ways to review subordinates behavior to identify bias treatment and provide examples of discipline um, we thought that was an important element. And I'm just highlighting some of the, the recommendations. The full recommendations are, are part of our report. Uh, and then um, we went further than that and looked at some basic training courses and, and specifically the principal policing in the community and made recommendations to strengthen those, to prioritize and provide in-depth teachings and discussion on implicit bias um, provide more context for the work that we're doing, include scenarios, and um, emphasize the, the procedural justice and real life examples of how to apply the tenets of, um, of procedural justice. So again, I'm, I'm you know, sort of skipping across the recommendations, but uh, they are available to you in the full report. Uh, we are available to you as ongoing thought partners and um, we are in this together to, to build public trust in law enforcement so law enforcement can do what it does best, which is protect the community. These recommendations are coming from an advisory board that is made up of both uh, law enforcement leaders as well as community members, academic, uh, academics and experts and faith leaders as well. I'll pause there um, and see if anyone has any questions for me. Thank you, Ms. Guerrero. A lot of hard work and significant issues. We really appreciate it. Does anyone have any comments or questions? Seeing no hands being raised, um, I think we will all look forward to seeing the report and I wanna thank you for being so succinct. Okay, all right, best of luck. Thanks for joining us today. All right, take care. You too. <clears throat>
As this was the last item on the consent agenda, is there a motion to approve the consent items? So Second. Second. Are there any questions or comments? Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Ron? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Motion passes. Commissioner Long will now provide the Finance Committee report. Jeff? Thank you. Um, we'll go quick. Uh, we'll forego the charts except for the uh, contracts that we'll have to vote on. Uh, we went through the prior year and current year budget status reports. They're all on target. They're all appropriate, no issues. Um, uh, there were three 2021 contracts that have been extended, already approved by the commission, all due to COVID, if there are any questions, uh, but they were the, the SLI, the Museum of Tolerance, and the NorCal uh, ICI SME. There were no issues or concerns expressed by the members of the Finance Committee for the extension of those three contracts. Uh, then we touched on and talked a bit about the 22-23 budget. Uh, in short, there's a couple of, there's three takeaways on the budget. One, um, there, there we go with the contracts, but on the budget, number one, it's a workload budget, almost the same as the 2022 budget, except for two major additions. Obviously the elephant is the SB2 uh, addition, the augmentation of uh, clo you know, 20, close to $23 million and 127 positions, essentially doubling the size of post. Uh, overnight. It's an expansion, the likes of which I don't think I've the percentage wise I've ever seen year to year in the in, in a department. Um, the SB2 uh, augmentation Maria has touched on and has already talked about. So unless there are specific questions from Maria, we can probably go quickly through that since she's already addressed the, the SB2 uh, workload and the augmentation. I will note uh, uh, that the legislative uh, analyst office is, was fairly complimentary of the BCP and the work done by Post and Finance on this. The takeaway from that is that the $27 million, $23 million augmentation is probably insufficient to deal with the size of the problem. Uh, LAO went through a number of problems, uh, all of which are gonna require more money, such as office space, such as HR department to hire all these people and deal with all these people with whom we really have no direct expertise at this point. But overall, it was very complimentary. The other addition to the budget that makes it uh, above the workload budget of last year is the uh, officer wellness plan, a $5 million program. Uh, $5 million is to be spent over three years. Uh, there will be additional questions, of course, on that as we go through budget uh, deliberations. There's, there's a quick summary of what we did until we got the contracts. Now, here's the list of contracts that we need to vote on today and share. There's 17 contracts on this chart, which also shows contrast over the past two years. Four of these contracts we don't need to deal with today. Uh, let's see, number is it 13 and 12 and 13. Yeah, uh, have already been dealt with as um, the commission has already approved them in their ongoing contracts. Other two additional contracts are seven and nine, the management course and the supervisory course. Uh, they're coming back uh, to us in May with a little tightening up, a little more defense of the, uh, of the costings and the baseline budgets. Uh, no prejudice there. They'll be back in May at no harm to them. Uh, so those four would come off. The only other caveat that we have from the Finance Committee on the contracts that need commission approval is number eight, the quality assessment program, which we've talked about a lot over the last year and a half. And while I remain not bowled over by the, uh, by the proposal and convinced that the return on investment is going to pan out, what we're going to do, if it's okay with the commission, is move forward with it as is and require six-month uh, detailed reports um, and in consultation with the executive director and everybody that's fine with that in terms of uh, giving us some more metrics in terms of uh, efficacy 
uh, return on investment and consequence. And so that is, the, oh, and there's one other point, uh, since it comes up next in the agenda, we discussed the issue of the executive director's additional contract authority, authority which will come up shortly. Um, this notion kind of emanated from the finance committee, particularly with uh, Commissioner Brazil, and the finance committee was fine with the staff proposal on expanding the executive director's contracting authority. With that, that should do it. Thank you, Commissioner Long. Uh, just for your information, Commissioner Long, one through nine are all together. Um, and does anyone object to me not taking a vote today, I'm specifically talking to the staff on contract items 12 and 13? Okay, hearing nothing, I'm gonna go ahead now and, and do the contract. Oh, excuse me, Madam Chair. Yeah. Somebody should, uh, staff should be paying more attention, I think. It's not, it's not 12 and 13 I spoke on, it's 14 and 15. Okay, stand by. Um, we do, we are not, looking, 14 and 15 are not listed here. We weren't uh, gonna handle them today. Correct. Madam Chair, we're also pulling off number seven and number nine. Okay. Right. so. I'll just say contracts one through six and eight. Correct. Okay, got it. Okay, everyone. We'll now move on to the reoccurring contracts. We will be reviewing and voting on the reoccurring contracts by Bureau. Please take a moment to review all the contracts under consideration. If there is a contract up for approval, which could be considered a conflict of interest <clears throat> for you, please abstain from the contract by number. Ms. Nunez will call the roll call vote for each group. When your name is called and the item you have identified is in that group, please say something like abstain from item three, but yes or no on the other contracts in the group. Are there any questions before we begin? I know we've all done this before. Pausing. Okay. We begin with training contracts for the Training Program Service Bureau, contracts one through six and eight. Is there a motion to approve these contracts? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Um, a second. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Can you, re can you announce who made the motion, please? No. Uh, <laughs> Lamont. Lamont. Was, <laughs> but Lamont, I, you were the first? Is I, that I may have. I may have been, but I'll, I'll defer to whoever else was speaking. I couldn't see them. Carrie, okay, this is, oh, I was gonna say, Carrie, this is Kathy. I, it was Doyle and Ewell at the same time for the motion. The okay, second. So we'll we'll mm -hmm. do Doyle as first and Ewell as second, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now um, Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Braun? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Bui? Yes. Donnellan? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Thank you. Okay, motion passes on to contract number 10. Next, we have contracts for the basic training bureau contract item 10. Is there a motion to approve this contract? Motion, Donlin. Thank you. Second? Rourke. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Braun? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donnellan? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Thank you. Thank you, that motion passes. Now on to contracts 11. Um, next we have contract for the Training Delivery and Compliance Bureau. As I said, contract item 11. Is there a motion to approve this contract? 
Doyle. Thank you. Second? Donlin. Donlin is second. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call <coughs> vote. Bar Barcelona? Yes. Ron? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Bowie? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Ewell? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Thank you. Thank you. That motion passes. On to next, we have contracts for the Learning Technology Resource Bureau, contract items 12 through 13. Is there a motion to approve these contracts? Nieto motion. Thank you. Second? Ron. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Ron? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Huey? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Edley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Thank you. Thank you. That motion passes on to contract 16. Next, we have a contract for the Strategic Communications and Research Bureau. Is there a motion to approve these contracts? Ron. Second. Brazil. Ms. Brazil. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona. Yes. Ron. Yes. Brazil. Yes. Bowie. Yes. Donalyn. Yes. Doyle. Yes. Dudley. Yes. Yule. Yes. Gordon. Yes. Long. Yes. Marsh. Yes. Nieto. Yes. O'Rourke. Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. And that motion passes on to contract item 17. Next, we have contracts for the Computer Services Bureau. Is there a motion to approve these contracts? Nieto move. Thank you. Second? Gordon. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Braun? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez? Thank you. Thank you. And that motion passed. Last, we have additional contracts for the Learning Technology Resource Bureau. Items 14 and 15. Is, no, um, Maria, is that the one we did not need to do? Right. That's correct. Okay. Was there any questions? Um, if there are, is there a motion? Okay, we don't need that. So I think we have successfully made it through the contracts. Am I missing anything, Manny or Maria? No, you are not, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, that concludes the finance report and reoccurring contracts. Again, Commissioner Long, thank you so much for the finance report. Now we'll move to the rest of the regular agenda. Madam Chair. Yes. You do need a motion to approve the finance report. Okay, thank you so much. Is there a motion to approve? I thought we did well, that. Okay. Is, is there a motion to approve the finance report? Motion, Donlin. Donlin, and who is the second? Louie. Thank you. Um, please take a roll call vote. Barcelona. Yes. Ron. Brazil. Yes. Bowie. Yes. Donalyn. Doyle. Yes. yes. Dudley. Yes. Yule. Yes. Gordon. Yes. Long. Yes. Marsh. Yes. Nieto. Yes. O'Rourke. Yep. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. On to the executive office. Item D is a report on the increase of spending authority for the executive director. That's been referred to a few times here. At this time, I'll call upon Assistant Executive Director Maria Sandoval to provide us a report on this item. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
On February 28, 2013, the commission approved and increased the executive director's contract approval limit from 50,000 to 175, as well as a contract amendment limit from 12,500 to 25,000. The commission on post has not increased the executive director's signing authority for nine years, despite the annual price increases. As a result, post has encountered delays in making minor contract adjustments while awaiting upcoming commission meetings. At the meeting of the commission on December 8, 2021, several commissioners opined that the existing executive director's contract approval limits were too low and should be increased. As a result, the commission directed post staff to make recommendations as to how much those limits should be raised. This agenda item addresses the change tasked by the commission. Post staff recommends a commission raise the approval limit of the executive director signing authority for contracts from $175,000 to $250,000. Additionally, post staff recommends the commission raise the existing amendment amount from $25,000 to 10% of an existing contract or $25,000, whichever is higher, but not to exceed $250,000. Thank you. I tried to Thank go. Thank you, Assistant question. Director Sandoval. You're welcome. Um, are there any questions? Did the advisory committee have any comments on this item? Madam Chair, the advisory committee did review this item and recommends approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the changes as described in the staff report? Motion to approve. Your Thank, you. Thank you. Second? Brazil. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Braun? Yes. Zill? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. Motion passes. Item E is a report on proposed changes to Commission Regulation 1005. At this point, I will call upon Staff Services Manager David Cheng, Chaining Program Service Bureau, to provide us a report on this item. David? Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Thank you. My name is David Chang. I'm uh, the Operations Supervisor for Training Program Services Bureau. And sitting next to me is uh, my bureau chief, our, our bureau chief, Mike Rafford. At the February 8th, 2018 commission meeting, the commission approved the change to commission regulation 1005 and 1015 and commission procedure D14, which changed the title of the investigation and trial preparation course to district attorney investigator transition course. In addition to the title change, the hours were reduced from 80 hours to 40, and the numbers of required learning domains were reduced to nine. These changes were recommended to better reflect the need of the stakeholders or identified by a group of subject matter experts. Uh, when the changes to the commission regulation 1005 and 1015, the com and commission procedure D14 were proposed and ultimately approved, the updated training specification were inadvertently left out of the proposed change. Uh, the proposed change to, is to repeal the incorporate by reference document training specifications for the investigation and trial preparation course and adopt the document training specifications for district attorney investigator, investigator transition course to be incorporated by reference. And it is necessary to correct this staff oversight and ensure presenters of the updated course have access to the most current content requirements. Uh, post staff re recommends commission to approve the revision uh, of commission regulation 1005 and pursuant to uh, rulemaking process and the office of administrative law. If no request for public hearing, the amendments will be effective October 1st, 2022. Thank you, Mr. Cheng. Um, are there any questions? Seeing none, did the advisory committee have any comments on this item? The advisory committee did review this item and recommends approval. Thank you. Is there a motion to approve the changes as described by the staff report? Doyle. Thank you. Second? Louis. Thank you. Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? 
Yes. Braun? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. And the motion does pass. On to the advisory committee. The advisory committee acting chair, Randy Waltz, will report on the advisory committee's meeting held this morning. Chair Waltz or Sheriff Waltz, please go on. Thank you. Um, the advisory committee subcommittee actually received and reviewed nominations for the Post Excellence in Training Awards in three categories, individual, organizational, and lifetime, as well as the O.J. Bud Hawkins Award. Um, I, we uh, discussed these in depth, and um, I took lots of notes. And during my lunch, I wrote out four pages of an amazing tome that um, I'm not going to read all of it to you in the interest of brevity, but I will report to you our uh, recommendations to the commission for these awards. Thank um, you. For the, the recipient that we recommend for the individual award is Jorge M. Ramirez, District Attorney Investigative Captain of the Monterey County District Attorney's Office. Uh, Jorge is a post-advanced instructor, plans to complete the master instructor certification um, he, the high points of this are that he recognized the need and teaches a domestic violence sexual assault update course for patrol officers so they can conduct better investigations in these cases. And then also after legislation was enacted in 2019, uh, Jorge recognized the need and took a trainer, train the trainer course for LGBT awareness for law enforcement. He's been presenting these courses in Monterey. San Benito and Sacramento counties. And he's trained over 500 law enforcement professionals and over 1,000 members of the public. Um, his accomplishments with his training have brought positive recognition to his agency and others. And his DA received an innovation and training award from California District Attorneys Association in recognition for his work. So it's always good to get your boss an award. The runner-up in uh, individual is Ken George, Academy Coordinator for Allen Hancock College. And I won't go into all of his um, accomplishments, but I will forward this to Assistant Executive Director. Um, he's been a coordinator at Allen Han Hancock since 2010, and he oversees all the functions of the basic intensive course. And he's brought some innovative uh, programs into that program. For organizational, our recommendation for recipient is the California Department of Insurance, CDI, the Enforcement Branch Headquarters Training Unit. Uh, they developed a proprietary software package that tracks the activities and documentation in their field training program. Rather than a physical form, which is commonly used, uh, documentation is submitted digitally, which is forwarded to a coordinator for approval and to the trainee for acknowledgement provides immediate feedback and quickly identifies potential training issues to help the trainee succeed. Uh, that information is very transparent and accessible to the trainer, trainee, and to management. Uh, the runner up in this category is the California Highway Patrol Middle Management Training Course with similar goals to the creation of their Sergeant's Leadership Forum for which they received the organizational award last year, CHP created the Middle Management Training Course. It's a 120 hour leadership course centered around six pillars, anchored in ethics, inspire a culture of trust, be vulnerable, create vision, execute strategy and coach potential, uh, initiates higher level thinking, global visioning, at the middle management level. And uh, CHP does have a great reputation for creating training courses for all levels in their organization. They also plan to host train the trainer courses for outside agencies. 
for the lifetime category, the recipient we recommend is Mike R. Golly, Deputy DA, Santa Clara DA's office, and he's post instructor with South Bay Public Safety Regional Training. He has been teaching law enforcement audiences since 1985. His specialties include search warrants, search and seizure, asset forfeiture, criminal case filing, and law enforcement prosecutor relations. Um, uh, let's see. He took it upon himself to fully research, write, and publish the most current California search warrant manual. And he updates it with new additions every 18 months. He does this at his own expense and receives no compensation for this. He also researches, writes, and publishes a search and seizure manual for law enforcement and prosecutors. I think um, most people have used that manual extensively. If you've written any search warrants, uh, he provides his contact information to all of his students and encourages them to contact him when they have questions. He does receive hundreds of calls per year uh, for the past 25 years, and he's personally written over 2,200 search warrants for law enforcement officers throughout the Bay Area. Finally, recommended recipient. Oh, and also, uh, we did not have a runner-up in that category in lifetime. The recommended recipient for the OJ Bud Hawkins Exceptional Service Award is Edward C. Flores, Director of Program Services, South Bay Regional Public Safety Training Consortium. Edward Flores has over 35 years of law enforcement experience, serving with Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office and as Chief of Santa Clara County Department of Correction. Um, Along with many other training duties during his career, Ed has been involved with the post management course for the past eight years as the on site course coordinator and oversees and directs all post management courses in Northern California. He's also the full time director of program services at South Bay Regional Public Safety Training and provides oversight and direction for academy staff responsible for many post courses, including management, supervisor, and the ICI courses. Um, he strives to keep curriculum current. He successfully graduated over 800 law enforcement managers from his courses, and the instructor evaluations that he received has received are overwhelmingly positive and have many references to currency and relevancy of the materials. Uh, that's his contribution to the furtherance of post mission and goals of educating and developing newly promoted law enforcement managers. And that is the end of my report. Thank you, Sheriff Wells, for uh, all the work you did on that committee this morning, for the work you did over lunch and for being so succinct today. Are there any questions for the advisory committee? Seeing nothing, at this point, I will ask for a motion to approve the advisory committee's recommendation for the winners of the Excellence in Training Awards and O.J. Bud's Hawkins Award. Is there a motion? We had a motion. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Hearing nothing, Ms. Nunez, please do a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Braun? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Bowie? Yes. Donnellan? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez, thank you. Thank you, motion passes. And finally, do I have a motion to accept the advisory committee report? Gordon. Present. Okay, who was the first? I, Gordon. I defer. Okay, 
Gordon first, Yul second. Thank you both so much. This is always so difficult to choreograph. You guys are great. Um, <laughs> Ms. Nonia, please do a, a roll call vote. Barcelona? Yes. Ron? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Bowie? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. The following correspondence was sent from post. From post to Timothy Albright, Chief Elk Grove Police Department, expressing true sympathy over the tragic on-duty death of Officer Tyler Liebman. Eric Parra, Chief Huntington Beach Police Department, expressing deep sympathy over the tragic on-duty death of Officer Nicholas Vela. Robert Felice, Chief Salinas Police Department, expressing deep sympathy over the tragic on-duty death of Officer Jorge David Alvarado. As to old business, there is no old business for discussion. As to new business, item one regarding reappointments and appointments for several advisory committee members. Manny, at this time, I would like to call upon Executive Director Alvarez to discuss the new business items. Manny? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. There are two nominations for the advisory board. The first is a nomination to appoint uh, Mr. Walter Allen to the advisory committee. Uh, the nomination is by the California Direct Academy Directors Association, or CADA. Um, he would be replacing uh, Mr. Damian Sandoval, who is rotating off uh, pursuant to CADA's re uh, re internal regulations. I believe you heard a, uh, a speaker during uh, public comment uh, voicing uh, their advocacy for Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen is currently the director of the Police Academy at Rio Hondo Community College in Los Angeles County. The second one is a reappointment for, for uh, Professor Kathy Oborn. Um, she's the president of the California Association of Administration of Justice Educators, or KG. She currently serves on the Post Advisory Committee. She was on uh, this morning, if any of you saw the, uh, the Advisory Committee. So those are two nominations for the Advisory uh, Committee. Thank you. Are there any questions? Seeing none, if the commission concurs, the appropriate action would be a motion to approve the appointment of Walter Allen to the Advisory Committee. Is there such a motion? Motion buoy. Thank you. Second? Gordon. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We don't need a roll call for that one. So um, any opposed? That motion also carries. And that motion passes. I think Are there any questions? I think we do Sorry. need a roll call vote. Oh, motion. Okay, well, the script says we don't, but okay. Let's All do right. a roll call vote, Ms. Nunez. Barcelona? Yes. Ron? Yes. Brazil? Yes. Louis? Yes. Donalyn? Yes. Doyle? Yes. Dudley? Yes. Yule? Y yes. Gordon? Yes. Long? Yes. Marsh? Yes. Nieto? Yes. O'Rourke? Yes. Ramirez, thank you. Thank you, and that motion passes. The advisory committee member term is expiring, so the request is to appoint Professor Kathy Oborn, O-B-O-R-N, President, California Association of Administration of Justice Educators, to the Post Advisory Commission. Are there any questions? Is there a motion? Do I Okay, let me, let, me, let me state the motion. If the commission concurs, the appropriate action would be a motion to approve the reappointment of Professor Kathy O'Born to the advisory committee. And Doyle, did you approve that motion? Was yes. that you? Thank yes. you. The second? Brazil. Thank you. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, but apparently I'm guessing this is a roll call vote too. So let's yes. do it. I'm sorry. 
That's okay. Barcelona. Yes. Braun. Yes. Brazil. Yes. Bowie. Yes. Donnellan. Yes. Doyle. Yes. Dudley. Yes. Yule. Yes. Gordon. Yes. Long. Yes. Marsh. Yes. Nieto. Yes. Her work. Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you. Motion carries and motion passes. Okay, just a quick reminder of the updates, the commission meeting. We did settle on April 7th in Sacramento. Um, so please make sure you add those to your schedules. And at this point, that's going to be an all day meeting. So for those from out of town, please get there the night before. May 24th through 26th, 2022 will be a post meeting in West Sacramento. August 2022, I believe that will also, in a cost saving effort, be in Sacramento, West Sacramento. November 30th to December 1, 2022, post West Sacramento. And March 1st through 2nd, 2023, to be determined. Um, June 7th and 8th, 2023, post West Sacramento. Commissioners, is there anything else? Would you repeat the May um, location? Sure. Yes, that's May 24th through 26th. Location. I, I my my. Uh, was I? Sacramento. Oh, okay, because my my agenda says San Diego. So. Well, you're talking about August. No, all I'm right. talking about no, May 20, no, May. May. Okay, all May. the meetings so far are in okay. Sacramento, <clears throat> West Sacramento, in a cost saving okay. effort. All right. All good. Thank I, you, Bob. I, perfect. <laughs> okay, Bob, I'm going to miss you on April seventh. Um, commissioners, is there anything else? Yeah, Madam Chair, this is Yule. Yes. Uh, just, just wanted to compliment Commissioner Long, uh, Director Alvarez, and all of the staff for the increase in um, funding and staffing for SB2. It's quite an accomplishment. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Abs a Herculean effort, and I appreciate you saying that, as do all of them. Anything else? Okay, I'll call for a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there such a motion? Doyle. Thank you. Is there a second? Nieto. Or and Ms. Nunez, for the final time today, please do a roll call vote. You guys don't want to hear my voice one more time, right? It's okay. Uh, Barcelona. Yes. Braun. Yes. Brazil. Yes. Bowie. Yes. Donnellan. Yes. Doyle. Yes. Dudley. Yes. Yule. Yes. Gordon. Yes. Long. Yes. Marsh. Yes. Nieto. Yes. O'Rourke. Yes. Ramirez. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. You've been your usual wonderful selves. Um, the meeting is adjourned, and I look forward to seeing you all face-to-face -face on the 7th. And again, Sheriff Doyle, you'll be sorely missed. Bye-bye. Good job, Kathy, on recording all this. Hey, thank you so much. See you in April. Bye, everybody. <laughs>